Blood of the Fold by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 94. She straightened, smiling again. If you wish, my lord, she scratched the side of her nose. What are your questions, then? Tobias leaned back, studying the woman's waiting eyes. The Midlands has been in turmoil of late, and we want to know if the Keeper's minions have a hand in the strife shadowing the lands. Have you heard any of the council members speak against the Creator? Councillors rarely come down to the market to discuss theology with old ladies, my lord. Nor would I suppose any would be so foolish as to publicly reveal any underworld connections, had they any? Well, what have you heard about what they have had to say? She lifted an eyebrow. You wish to hear rumours from Stentner Street, my lord? State which sort of rumour it is you would like to hear, and I can tell you one to fit your needs. Tobias drummed his fingers on the table. I am not interested in rumour, madam, simply the truth. She nodded. Of course you are, my lord, and you shall have it. Sometimes people can be interested in the most foolish of things. He cleared his throat in annoyance. I've heard any number of rumours already and don't need any more. I need to know the truth of what has been going on in Aden Drill. Why, I've even heard that the council has been executed as well as the mother confessor. Her narrow-eyed smile returned. Then why wouldn't a man of your high status simply stop by the palace as he rode in and ask to see the council? That would make more sense than dragging in all sort of people who would have no direct knowledge and asking them. The truth would be better discerned with your own eyes, my lord. Brogan pressed his lips together. I wasn't here when the rumours say the Mother Confessor was executed. Ah, so it's the Mother Confessor you're interested in, then. Why didn't you simply say so, instead of going all round about? I heard that she was beheaded, but I didn't see it. My granddaughter saw it, though, didn't you, my dear? The little girl nodded. Yes, my lord, saw it myself, I did. Chopped her head right off, they did. Brogan made a show of sighing. That was what I feared. She is dead, then. The girl shook her head. Didn't say that, my lord. I said I saw them chop off her head. She looked right into his eyes and smiled. What do you mean by that? Brogan shot a glare up at the old woman. What does she mean by that? What she says, my lord. Aiden Drill has always been a city with a strong undercurrent of magic, but it has been fairly crackling with it of late. Where magic is involved, you can't always trust your eyes alone. Though she is young, this one is smart enough to know that much. A man of your profession would know it too. Crackling with magic? That portends evil. What do you know about the Keeper's minions? Terrible they are, my lord. But magic is in itself not evil. It exists without guile of its own. Brogan's fists tightened. Magic is the Keeper's taint. She cackled again. That would be like saying that the shiny silver knife at your belt is the keeper's taint. If used to menace or harm an innocent, then the holder of the knife is evil. But if, for instance, it is used to defend life against a fanatical lunatic, no matter his high standing, then the holder of the knife is good. The knife is neither, because each can use it. Her eyes seemed to go out of focus, and her voice lowered to a hiss. But if used for retribution, magic is vengeance incarnate. Well then, in your view, is this magic you say is about in the city being used for good or evil? For both, my lord. This is, after all, the home of the wizard's keep and a seat of power. Confessors have ruled here for thousands of years, as well as wizards. Power draws power. Conflict is afoot. Scaled creatures called Mriswith have begun to appear out of the very air and gut any innocent in their way. An ominous omen, if ever there was one. Other magic lurks to snatch the rash or unwary. Why, the very night is alive with magic carried on the gossamer wings of dreams. She peered at him with one faded blue eye as she went on. A child who is fascinated with fire could easily be incinerated here. Such a child would be well advised to be very careful and leave at the first opportunity before he inadvertently puts his hand into a flame. Why, people are even pulled off the street to have their words filtered through a sieve of magic. Brogan leaned forward with a smoldering expression. 
And what do you know about magic, madam? An equivocal question, my lord. Could you be more explicit? Tobias paused for a moment, trying to pick the nettles out of her ramblings. He had dealt with her kind before, and he realized she was gulling him off the subject, off the trail. He brought back his polite smile. Well, for instance, your granddaughter says she saw the mother confessor beheaded, but that that doesn't mean she be dead. You say magic can make it so. I'm intrigued by such a statement. While it's true that I know magic can occasionally fool people, I've only heard of it working small deceptions. Could you explain how death could be revoked? Revoke death? The keeper has such power. Brogan pressed forward against the table. Are you saying the keeper himself brought her back to life? She cackled. Now, my lord, you are so persistent in what you want that you do not pay attention and hear only what you want to hear. You specifically asked how death could be revoked. The keeper can revoke death. At least I'm assuming he can because he is the ruler of the dead. Holds power over life and death, so it's only natural to believe that... Is she alive or not? The old woman blinked at him. How would I know that, my lord? Brogan ground his teeth. You said that just because people saw her beheaded, that doesn't mean she be dead. Oh, back to that, are we? Well, magic can perform such a ruse, but that does not mean it did. I said only that it could. Then you went off scent asking about death being revoked. Quite a separate issue, my lord. How, woman? How can magic accomplish such a high deception? She snugged the tattered blanket up around her shoulders. A death spell, my lord. Brogan glanced to Lunetta. Her beady eyes were fixed on the old woman, and she was scratching her arms. A death spell. And what exactly is a death spell? Well, I've never seen one executed, so to speak. She chuckled at her own joke. So I can't give you proper witness, but I can't tell you what I've been told. If you've a wish to hear second-hand knowledge... Brogan spoke through clenched teeth. Tell me. Seeing a death, comprehending it, is something we all recognize at a spiritual level. It's this seeing of a body with its soul or spirit departed that we recognize as death. A death spell can mimic a real death by making people believe they have seen a death, that they have seen the body without its soul, and so make them viscerally accept the event as true. She shook her head, as if she found the matter both amazing and scandalizing. Very dangerous it is. It requires invoking the aid of the spirits to hold the person's spirit while the web is cast. If anything goes wrong, the subject spirit would be cast helpless into the underworld. A very unpleasant way to die. If everything goes right, and if the spirits return that which they have preserved, I am told it will work and the person will live, but those seeing it will think them dead. Very chancy, though. While I've heard of it, I've never heard of it actually being attempted, so it may be nothing more than hearsay. Brogan sat quietly, moving the pieces of information around in his mind, pulling together things he had learned this day, and things he had learned in the past, searching for the right fit. It must have been a trick done to escape justice, but not one she could have accomplished without accomplices. The old woman put a hand to the girl's shoulder and started shuffling off. Thank you for the warmth, my lord, but I grow tired of your haphazard questions, and I have better things to do. Who could perform a death spell? The old woman halted. Her washed-out blue eyes lit up with a dangerous cast. Only a wizard, my lord. Only a wizard of immense power and great knowledge. Brogan fixed her with a dangerous look of his own. And are there any wizards here in Aidendril? Her slow smile made her faded eyes gleam. She reached into a pocket under the blanket and tossed a coin on the table where it spun in lazy circles before finally toppling over before him. Brogan picked up the silver coin, squinting at the strike. I asked a question, old woman. I expect an answer. You hold it, my lord. I've never seen a coin like this. What's this image on it? It looks to be a grand structure of some sort. Oh, it is, my lord, she hissed. It's the spawn of salvation and doom, of wizards and magic. The palace of the prophets. Never heard of it. What is this palace of the prophets? The old woman smiled a private smile. Ask your sorceress, my lord. 
She turned again to leave. Brogan shot to his feet. No one gave you permission to leave, you toothless old hag. She peered back over her shoulder. It's the liver, my lord. Brogan blinked. What? I've a taste for raw liver, my lord. I believe that's what makes the teeth fall out over time. Just then, Galtero appeared, squeezing past the woman and girl as they went through the doorway. He saluted with fingertips to bowed forehead. Lord General, I have a report. Yes, yes, in a moment. But Brogan held up a silencing finger to Galtero as he turned to Lunetta. Well? Every word true, Lord General. She'd be like a water bug, skimming the surface of the water, touching only the tips of her feet to it, but everything she said be true. She knows much more than she tells, but what she tells be true. Brogan waggled his hand impatiently for Ettore to come forward. The man stiffened to attention before the table as his crimson cape swished around his legs. Lord General! Brogan's eyes narrowed. I think we may have a baneling on our hands. How would you like to prove yourself worthy of the cape you wear? Yes, Lord General, very much. Before she gets out of the building, take her into custody. She'd be under suspicion of being a baneling. What of the girl, Lord General? Why aren't you watching, Ettore? She will no doubt prove to be the baneling's familiar. Besides, we don't want her out in the street crying out that her grandmama is being held by the blood of the fold. The other, the cook, would be missed, and that could bring troublemakers down around us, but this pair won't be missed from the street. They be ours now. Yes, Lord General. I will see to it at once. I will want to question her as soon as possible. The girl, too. Brogan held up a cautionary finger. They had better be ready to answer truthfully any question I ask. Ettore's youthful face bent into a gruesome grin. They will confess when you come to them, Lord General. By the Creator, they will be ready to confess. Very good, lad. Now be off. Before they gain the street. As Ettore dashed through the door, Galtero stepped impatiently forward, but waited silently before the table. Brogan sank down into the chair, his voice distant. Galtero, you did your usual thorough good job. The witnesses you brought me proved up to my standards. Tobias Brogan slid the silver coin aside, unfastened the leather straps on the case, and dumped his trophies into a pile on the table. With tender care, he spread them out, touching the once living flesh. Each was a desiccated nipple, the left nipple, the one closest to the Baneling's evil heart, with enough skin to include the tattooed name. They represented only a fraction of the Banelings he had uncovered, the most important of the important, the most vile of the Keeper's fiends. As he replaced the booty one at a time, he read the name of each Baneling he had put to the torch. He remembered each chase and capture and inquisition. Flames of anger flared up at remembering the unholy crimes to which each had finally confessed. He remembered justice being done each time. But he had yet to win the prize of prizes, the mother confessor. Galtero, he said in a soft, stony voice, I have a trail. Get the men together. We will leave at once. I think you had better hear what I have to say first, Lord General. Chapter 11 it be the Daharans, Lord General. After replacing the last of his trophies, Brogan flipped the lid shut on his case and looked up into Galtero's dark eyes. What about the Daharans? Early today, I knew something be afoot when they started gathering. That be what had the people in such turmoil. Gathering? Galtero nodded. Around the Confessor's palace, Lord General. At mid-afternoon, they all started chanting. Astonished, Tobias leaned toward his colonel. Chanting. Do you remember their words? Galtero hooked a thumb behind his weapons belt. It went on for two full hours. It would be hard to forget it after hearing it that many times. The Daharans bowed down forehead to the ground and all chanted the same words. Master all guide us. Master all teach us. Master all protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we be sheltered. In your wisdom we be humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives be yours. Brogan tapped a finger on the table. And all of the Daharans did this. How many are there? Every one of them, Lord General, and there be more than we thought. They filled the square around the palace, overflowed into the parks and plazas, and then the streets all around. You could not walk among them. They'd be packed in so tight, as if all wanted to be as close to the Confessor's palace as they could get. To my count, 
there be near to 200,000 in the city, with most gathered around the palace. While it went on, the people be in a near panic, not knowing what be happening. I rode out into the country, and there were a great many more who did not come into the city. They too, wherever they be, bowed forehead to the ground and chanted along with their brothers in the city. I rode hard to cover as much ground as possible and see all I could. And I did not see even one Daharan who not be bowed down chanting. You could hear their voices from the hills and passes around the city. None paid any heed to us as we scouted. Brogan closed his mouth. Then he must be here, this Master Rao. Galtero shifted his weight to his other foot. He be here, Lord General. While the Daharans chanted the whole time they chanted, he stood atop the steps of the grand entrance and watched. Every man was bowed to him as if he be the creator himself. Brogan's mouth twisted in disgust. I always suspected the Daharans were heathens. Imagine praying to a mere man. What happened then? Galtero looked tired. He had been riding hard all day. When it ended, they all leaped into the air, cheering and whooping for a good long time, as if they had just been delivered from the keeper's grasp. I was able to ride two miles around the back of the crowd while the shouting and acclaim went on. Finally, the men made way as two bodies were carried into the square, and all went silent. A pyre was thrown up and set ablaze. The whole time, until the bodies were ash and the ash at last taken to be buried, this Master Rall stood on the steps and watched. Did you get a good look at him? Galtero shook his head. The men were packed tight together, and I feared to force my way closer, lest they set upon me for interrupting their ceremony. Brogan rubbed his case with the side of a thumb as he stared off in thought. Of course. I wouldn't expect you to throw your life away just to try to see what the man looks like. Galtero hesitated a moment. You will see him yourself soon enough, Lord General. You have been invited to the palace. Brogan looked up. I don't have time for pleasantries. We must be off after the Mother Confessor. Galtero drew a paper from his pocket and handed it over. I returned just as a big group of Daharan soldiers were about to enter our palace. I stopped them and asked what they wanted, and they gave me this. Brogan unfolded the paper and read the hasty scrawl. Lord Rawl invites all dignitaries, diplomats, and officials of all lands to the confessor's palace at once. He crumpled the paper in his fist. I don't take audiences, I give them. And as I said, I don't have time for pleasantries. Galtero lifted a thumb toward the street. I reasoned as much and told the soldiers who gave it to me that I would pass the invitation along, but that we be busy with other matters, and I didn't know if anyone from the Nicobaris palace would have time to attend. He said that Lord Rall wanted everyone there, and we had better find the time. Brogan waved off the threat. No one is going to cause trouble here in Aidendrill because we don't attend a social affair to meet a new tribal leader. Lord General, King's Row be shoulder to shoulder with Daharan soldiers. Every palace on the row be surrounded, along with city administration buildings. The man who gave me the paper said he be here to escort us to the confessor's palace. He said that if we are not out there soon, they would come in and get us. He had 10,000 troops standing behind him watching me as he said it. These men are not shopkeepers and farmers playing at being soldier for a few months. These be professional warriors, and they look very determined. I have faith in the blood of the fold to go against these men, if we could get to our main force. But we brought only a fist of the fold with us into the city. 500 are not near enough men to fight our way out. We would not make it 20 yards before every one of us would be cut down. Brogan glanced at Lunetta, standing against the wall. She was stroking and smoothing her colored patches, not paying any attention to the discussion. They might have only 500 men in the city, but they also had Lunetta. He didn't know what this Lord Rawls game was, but it didn't really matter. Dahara was aligned with and took orders from the Imperial Order. It was probably just an attempt to put himself in higher standing within the Order. There were always those who wanted power, but didn't want to concern themselves with the moral imperative that went along with it. Very well. It will be dark soon anyway. We will go to this ceremony, smile at the new Master Rall, drink his wine, eat his food, and make him welcome. At dawn, we leave Aiden Drill to the Imperial Order and be off after the Mother Confessor. He gestured to his sister. Lunetta, come with us. At hell will you find her? Lunetta scratched her arm. The Mother Confessor, Lord General, how will you find her? Tobias pushed his chair back and stood. 
She be to the southwest. We have more than enough men to search. We will find her. Really? Lunetta still displayed a streak of insolence from having used her power. Tell me how you will know her. She be the mother confessor. How could we not know her, you stupid Streganicha? One brow arched as her feral gaze rose to meet his eyes. The mother confessor be dead. How can you see a dead person walking? She not be dead. The cook knows the truth of that. You said so yourself. The mother confessor be alive, and we will have her. If what the old woman say be true, and a death spell was cast, then what would be its purpose? Tell Lunetta. Tobias frowned. To make people think she was killed so she could escape. Lunetta smiled a sly smile. And why is it they did not see her escape? For the same reason you will not find her. Stop talking your magic jabber and tell me what you be talking about. Lord General, if there be such a thing as a death spell, and it be used on the mother confessor, then it would only make sense that the magic would hide her identity. It would explain how she escaped. No one recognized her because of the magic around her. For the same reason, you will not recognize her either. Can you break it? Break the spell? Tobias stammered. Lunetta chuckled. Lord General, I never heard of such magic before. I know nothing about it. Tobias realized his sister was right. You know about magic. Tell me how we can know her. Lunetta shook her head. Lord General, I do not know how to see the strands of a wizard's web that was cast for the express purpose of hiding. I tell you only what would make sense, and that be that if such a spell were used to hide her, then we too would not recognize her. He lifted a finger toward her. You have magic. You know a way to show us the truth. Lord General, the old woman said that only a wizard could cast a death spell. If a wizard casts such a web, then to unravel it, we must be able to see the strands of his web. I do not know how to see the truth through the magic's deception. Tobias rubbed his chin as he thought it over. See through the deception. But how? A moth be caught in a spider's web because he cannot see the strands. We be caught in this web, the same as those who saw her beheading because we cannot see its strands. I do not know how we can. Wizard, he murmured to himself. He gestured to the silver coin on the table. When I asked her if there be a wizard here in Aden Drill, she showed me that coin with a building on it. The Palace of the Prophets. The name brought his head up. Yes, that be what she called it. She said to ask you what it be. How do you know of it? Where did you hear about this Palace of the Prophets? Lunetta shrank back into herself and looked away. Just after you be born. Mama told me about it. It be a place where sorceresses... Streganicha, he corrected. She paused a moment. It be a place where Streganicha train men to be wizards. Then it be a house of evil. She stood stooped and stiff as he looked down at the coin. What would Mama know about such an evil place? Mama be dead, Tobias. Leave her be, she whispered. He shot her a withering scowl. We will talk about this later. He straightened his sash of rank and ordered his silver-embroidered gray coat before picking up his crimson cape. The old woman must have meant that there be a wizard in Aidendril who was trained at this house of evil. He redirected his attention to Galtero. Fortunately, Etori is holding her for further questioning. That old woman has a lot more to tell us. I can feel it in my bones. Galtero nodded. We better be off for the Confessor's Palace, Lord General. Brogan flung his cape over his shoulders. We will stop to see Etori on our way out. A fire had been well stoked and was roaring when the three of them entered the small room to check on Itore and his two charges. Itore was stripped to the waist, his lean muscles coated with a sheen of sweat. Several razors gleamed from their place atop the mantel, along with an assortment of sharpened spikes. The ends of the iron rods were fanned out across the hearth. Their other ends glowed orange in the flames. The old woman cowered in the far corner and put a protective arm around the girl, who hid her face in the brown blanket. Has she given you any trouble? Brogan asked. Etori flashed his familiar grin. Her arrogant attitude vanished as soon as she found out we don't suffer insolence. That be the way with banelings. They give way when faced with the Creator's might. The three of us have to go out for a while. The rest of the fist will remain here at the palace in case you need assistance. Brogan glanced to the iron rods glowing in the fire. 
When I get back, I want her confession. I don't care about the girl, but the old woman had better still be alive and anxious to give it. Etore touched his fingers to his forehead as he bowed. By the Creator, it shall be as you command, Lord General. She will confess all the crimes she has performed for the Keeper. Good. I have more questions, and I will have the answers. I'll answer no more of your questions, the old woman said. Etore curled his lip as he scowled over his shoulder. The old woman shrank back farther into the dark corner. You'll break that oath before this night be over, you old hag. You'll be begging to answer questions when you see what I do to your little evil one. You get to watch her go first, so you can think about what be coming when it be your turn. The little girl squealed and burrowed deeper into the old woman's blanket. Lunetta stared at the pair in the corner as she slowly scratched her arm. Do you wish me to stay and attend Ettore, Lord General? I think it'd be best if I did. No, I want you to come with me tonight. He glanced up at Galtero. You did well bringing me this one. Galtero shook his head. I never would have noticed her had she not tried to sell me honey cakes. Something about her made me suspicious. Brogan shrugged. That be the way with banelings. They be drawn to the blood of the fold like moths to a flame. They be bold because they have faith in their evil master. He glanced again to the woman cringing in the corner. But they all lose their spines when facing justice from the blood of the fold. This one will be a small trophy, but the creator will be served by it. Chapter 12 Stop it, Tobias growled. People will think you have fleas. On a wide street lined with majestic maple trees to each side, their bare thicket of branches laced together overhead, dignitaries and officials from different lands stepped from fancy coaches to meander the remaining distance to the confessor's palace. Daharan troops stood like banks at the edge of the trickling river of arriving guests. I cannot help it, Lord General, Lunetta complained as she scratched. Ever since we arrived in Aidendril, my arms be itching. I have never felt it like this before. People joining the flow stared openly at Lunetta. Her tattered rags made her stand out like a leper at a coronation. She seemed oblivious of the mocking stares. More likely, she thought them looks of admiration. She had, on any number of occasions, begged off donning any of the dresses Tobias offered her, saying that none were the match of her pretties. Since they seemed to keep her mind occupied and off the keeper's taint, he never went so far as to insist she wear something else, and besides, he thought it blasphemy to make one touched by evil look appealing. The arriving men were dressed in their finest robes, coats, or furs, though some wore ornate swords. Tobias was sure they were only decoration and doubted that a one of them had ever been drawn in fear, much less anger. As an occasional wrap billowed open, he could see that the women were attired in elegant, layered gowns, the setting sun glinting off the jewels at their necks, wrists, and fingers. It would appear they were all so excited to be invited to the confessor's palace to meet the new Lord Rall that they had not elicited a threat from the Daharan soldiers. By their smiles and chatter, they all seem anxious to ingratiate themselves with the new Lord Rall. Tobias ground his teeth. If you don't stop scratching, I'll tie your hands behind your back. Lunetta dropped her hands to her sides and stopped with a gasp. Tobias and Galtero looked up to see bodies impaled on poles to each side of the promenade ahead. As the three of them approached, he realized they weren't men, but scaled creatures only the keeper could have conceived. As they proceeded, a stink enveloped them, as thick as a bog mist, making them fear to draw breath, lest it blacken their lungs. Some of the poles held only heads, some held whole bodies, and others parts of bodies. All appeared to have been killed in a brutal battle. Some of the beasts had been ripped open, and several were cleaved completely in two, their innards hanging frozen from what was left of them. It was like stepping through a monument to evil, through the gates to the underworld. The other guests covered their noses as best they could with whatever they had handy. A few of the finely dressed women sank to the ground in a swoon. Attendants rushed to their aid, fanning them with handkerchiefs or rubbing a bit of snow on their foreheads. Some of the people stared in astonishment while others shuddered so violently that Tobias could hear their teeth rattling. By the time they had run the gauntlet of sights and smells, everyone around them was in a state of either high anxiety or open alarm. Tobias, having often walked among evil, regarded his fellow guests with disgust. 
When the shaken diplomat asked, one of the Daharans to the side explained that the creatures had attacked the city and Lord Rahl had slain them. The mood of the guests brightened. As they moved on, their voices became exuberant as they chatted about the honor of meeting such a man as the new Lord Rahl, the master of all Dahara. Effervescent chuckles drifted on the chilling air. Galtero leaned close. While I was out earlier, before all the chanting and the soldiers around the city were still talkative, they told me to be wary that there had been attacks by unseen creatures, and a number of their men, as well as people on the streets, had been killed. Tobias remembered the old woman telling him that scaled creatures, he couldn't recall what she had called them, had begun to appear out of the air to gut anyone in their way. Lunetta had said that the woman's words were true. These must be the creatures. How convenient of Lord Rahl to arrive just in time to slay the creatures and save the city. Mriswith, Lunetta said. What? The woman said that the creatures be called Mriswith. Tobias nodded. Yes, I believe you're right, Mriswith. White columns towered outside the entrance to the palace. The ranks of soldiers to each side funneled them through white carved doors spread wide and into a grand hall lit with windows of pale blue glass set between polished white marble columns topped with gold capitals. Tobias Brogan could feel himself being sucked into the belly of evil. The other guests, had a one of them known better, would be shuddering at the living monument to profanity that surrounded them, instead of dead carcasses. After a journey through elegant halls and chambers with enough granite and marble to build a mountain, they at last passed through tall mahogany doors to enter an enormous chamber, capped with a huge dome. Ornate frescoes of men and women swept across the ceiling overlooking the assembly. Round windows around the lower edge of the dome let in the waning light and revealed clouds gathering in a darkening sky. Across the room on a semicircular dais, the chairs behind the resplendent carved desk sat empty. Arched openings around the room covered stairways up to colonnaded balconies edged with sinuous polished mahogany railings. The balconies were filled with people, he noticed, not finely dressed nobility like those on the main floor, but common working people. The other guests noticed, too, and cast disapproving glances up at the riffraff in the shadows behind the railings. The people crowded there stood back from the railings, as if seeking obscurity in the darkness, lest any of them should be recognized and called to account for daring to be at so grand a function. It was customary for a great man to be introduced to the people in authority first, before letting himself be known to ordinary people. Ignoring the audience in the balcony, the guests spread out across the patterned marble floor, keeping distance between themselves and the two blood of the fold and trying to make it seem accidental, rather than by intention that they avoided the two. They looked about expectantly for their host while bending to whisper among themselves. Dressed as finely as they were, they almost looked to be part of the ornate carvings and decoration, none betrayed being awed by the grandeur of the confessor's palace. Tobias guessed that most were frequent visitors. Though he had never been to Aidendril before, he knew sycophants when he saw them. His own king had been surrounded by enough of them. Lunetta stayed close to his side, only mildly interested in the imposing architecture around her. She took no notice of the people who stared at her. Though there were fewer of those now, they were more interested in each other and in the prospect of finally meeting Lord Rahl than in worrying about an odd woman standing between two crimson-caped blood of the fold. Galtero's gaze swept the expansive room, ignoring the opulence, and instead taking constant appraisal of the people the soldiers and the exits. The swords he and Tobias wore were not decoration. Despite his revulsion, Tobias couldn't help marveling at where he stood. This was the spot from where the mother confessors and wizards had pulled the strings of the Midlands. This was where the council for thousands of years had stood for unity while preserving and protecting magic. This was the spot from which the keeper's tendrils spread forth. That unity was shattered now. Magic had lost its grip on man, lost its protection. The age of magic was ended, the Midlands was ended. Soon the palace would be filled with crimson capes and only the blood of the fold would be seated at the dais. Tobias smiled. Events were moving inexorably toward a providential end. A man and woman drifted near, purposefully, Tobias thought. The woman with a pile of black hair and wispy curls hanging down around her painted face leaned casually toward him. Imagine, we are invited here and they don't even have anything to eat. 
She smoothed the lace at the bosom of her yellow dress, a polite smile coming to her impossibly red lips as she waited for him to speak. He didn't, and she went on. Seems very vulgar not to offer so much as a drop of wine, don't you think? Considering that we've come on such short notice and all. I hope he doesn't expect we will accept his invitation again after treating us so boorishly. Tobias clasped his hands behind his back. Do you know Lord Rao? I may have met him before, I don't recall. She brushed a speck which he couldn't see from her bare shoulder, affording the jewels on her fingers, which even someone across the room would have been able to see, the opportunity to glitter before his eyes. I'm invited to so many of these affairs here at the palace that I have difficulty remembering all the people who strive to meet me. After all, Duke Lumholtz and I would appear to find ourselves in a position of leadership, what with Prince Firen having been murdered. Her red lips plumped into a simper. I do know that I've never met any of the blood of the fold here before. After all, the council has always viewed the blood as officious. Not that I'm saying I would agree, mind you, but they have forbade them from practicing their craft anywhere outside their homeland. Of course, we would seem to be without a council now. Quite ghastly, they're being killed like they were, right here, and while they were deliberating the future course of the Midlands. What brings you here, sir? Tobias glanced past her to see soldiers closing the doors. He knuckled his mustache as he started wandering toward the dais. I was invited, the same as you. Duchess Lumholtz strolled with him. I hear that the blood are held in high esteem by the Imperial Order. The man with her, dressed in a gold-braided blue coat and displaying the carriage of authority, listened with strained indifference as he worked at appearing to have his attention elsewhere. By his dark hair and heavy brow, Tobias had already guessed him as Keltish. The Keltons had been quick to align themselves with the Order and possessively guarded their high status among them. They also knew that the Imperial Order respected the opinion of the Blood of the Fold. I am surprised, madam, that you hear anything as much as you talk. Her face flushed as red as her lips. Tobias was spared her predictable indignant retort when the crowd noticed a commotion across the room. He was not tall enough to see over the turned head, so he waited patiently, knowing that in all likelihood Lord Rahl would take to the raised dais. He had placed himself carefully for that probability, close enough to be able to make an appraisal, but not so close as to stand out. Unlike the other guests, he knew this was no social function. This would likely be a stormy night, and if there was lightning, he didn't want to be the tallest tree. Tobias Brogan, unlike the fluttering fools about him, knew when prudence was warranted. Across the room, people hurriedly tried to make way for an echelon of Daharan soldiers, wedging them aside to clear a path. A massive rank of pikemen followed, peeling off in pairs to form an ironclad corridor free of guests. The echelon deployed before the dais, a grim protective wedge of Daharan muscle and steel. The swift precision was impressive. High-ranking Daharan officers marched up the corridor to stand beside the dais. Over the top of Lunetta's head, Tobias met Galtero's icy gaze. No social function indeed. The crowd buzzed in nervous anticipation as they waited to see what was to come next. By the whispers Tobias could overhear, this was well beyond precedent in the Confessor's palace. Red-faced dignitaries murmured their indignation to one another over what they considered an intolerable use of armed force in the council chambers, where diplomatic negotiation was the rule. Brogan had no tolerance for diplomacy. Blood worked better and left a more lasting impression. He was getting the impression that Lord Rahl understood this too, unlike the sea of obsequious faces crowding the floor. Tobias knew what this Lord Rahl wanted. It was only to be expected after all. The Daharans had shouldered most of the load for the Imperial Order. In the mountains he had met a force that had been mostly Daharan on their way to Ebenissia. The Daharans had taken Aidendril, seen to keeping order, and then let the Imperial Order have dominion over it. In the name of the Order, they had put their flesh against the steel of rebels. Yet others, such as Keltons, like Duke Lumholtz, had held the positions of power and handed down the Orders, expecting the Daharans to fall on the points of enemy blades. Lord Rahl, no doubt, intended to lay claim to a place of high rank among the Imperial Order, and was going to coerce the gathered representatives into acceding. Tobias almost wished there had been food offered so that he could watch all the scheming officials choke on it when the new Lord Rahl made his demands. The two Daharans who entered next were so huge that Tobias could see their approach over the heads of the crowd. 
When they came into full view and he could see their leather armor, chain mail, and sharpened bands above their elbows, Galtero whispered to him over Lunetta's head, I've seen those two before. Where? Tobias whispered back. Galtero shook his head as he watched the men. Out on the street somewhere. Tobias turned back and to his astonishment saw three women in red leather following the two huge Daharans. From the reports Tobias had heard, they could be nothing other than Mord Sith. Mord Sith had a reputation for being wholly unhealthy to those with magic who opposed them. Tobias had once sought to acquire the services of one of these women, but had been told that they served only the master of Dahara, and were not indulgent of anyone making offers of any kind. As he had heard it told, they could not be bought for any price. If the Mord Sith made the crowd edgy, what came next made them gasp. Mouths dropped at the sight of a monstrous beast, one with claws, fangs, and wings. Even Tobias stiffened at the sight of a gar. Short-tailed gars were wildly aggressive, bloodthirsty brutes that would eat anything living. Since the boundary had fallen the past spring, gars had caused the blood of the fold no small amount of trouble. For the moment, this beast walked calmly behind the three women. When Tobias checked that his sword was clear in its scabbard, he noticed Galtero doing the same. Please, Lord General, Lunetta whined. I want to leave now. She was furiously scratching her arms. Brogan gripped her upper arm and drew her close, whispering through clenched teeth, You pay attention to this Lord Rahl, or I'll find I have no further use for you. Do you understand? And stop that scratching. Her eyes watered as he twisted her arm. Yes, Lord General. You pay attention to what he says. She nodded as the two huge Daharans took places at either end of the dais. The three women in red leather stepped up between them, leaving a place in the center empty, probably for Lord Rahl when he arrived at last. The gar towered behind the chairs. The blonde-headed moored Sith near the center of the dais looked around the room with a penetrating blue-eyed gaze that commanded silence. People of the Midlands, she said, lifting an introductory arm to the empty air above the desk. I present Lord Rahl. A shadow formed in the air. A black cloak appeared suddenly, and as it was thrown wide, there standing atop the dais was a man. Those near the front fell back in alarm. A scattering of people cried out in terror. Some called for the Creator's protection, others beseeched the spirits to intercede on their behalf, and some fell to their knees. While many stood in mute shock, a few of the decorative swords were drawn for the first time in fear. When a Daharan in the front of the echelon calmly warned in a low, icy voice to sheathe the weapons, they were reluctantly returned to scabbards. Lunetta was scratching frantically as she gazed up at the man, but Brogan didn't stop her this time. Even he could feel his skin crawling with the evil of magic. The man atop the desk waited patiently for the crowd to become silent, and then spoke in a quiet voice. I am Richard Rahl, called by the Daharans Lord Rahl. Other peoples have other titles by which I am known. Prophecies given in the dim past before the Midlands was born have placed appellation upon me. He stepped down off the desk to stand between the moored Sith. But it is the future I come before you to address. Though not as large as the two Daharans standing at each end of the curved desk, he was a big man, tall and muscular, and surprisingly young. His clothes, black cloak and high boots, dark trousers and plain shirt were unassuming, more so for one called Lord. Though it was hard to miss the gleam of a silver and gold scabbard at his hip, he looked to be nothing so much as a simple woodsman. Tobias thought, too, that the man looked tired, as if he bore a mountain of responsibility on his shoulders. Tobias was hardly a stranger to combat, and knew by the grace with which this young man carried himself, by the easy way the baldric lay across his shoulder, and by the way the sword moved with him at his hip, that he was not a man to be taken lightly. The sword was not there for decoration. It was a weapon. He looked to be a man who had made a great many desperate decisions of late, and had lived through them all. For all his outward humble appearance, he had an inexplicable air of authority about him, and a bearing that commanded attention. Already many of the women in the room had recovered their composure and were beginning to flash him private smiles as they batted their lashes, falling into their well-practiced habits of ingratiating themselves with those wielding power. Even if the man were not ruggedly handsome, they would have done the same but perhaps with less sincerity. Lord Rahl either didn't notice their warming demeanor or chose not to. But it was his eyes that interested Tobias Brogan. 
Eyes were the mark of a man's nature and the one thing that rarely deceived him. When this man's steely gaze settled on people, some stepped back without realizing it, some froze and others fidgeted. When those eyes turned in his direction and the gaze settled on him for the first time, Tobias took a measure of Lord Rahl's heart and soul. That brief look was all he needed. This was a very dangerous man. Though he was young and ill at ease, being the center of all eyes, this was a man who would fight with a vengeance. Tobias had seen eyes like this before. This was a man who would jump headlong over a cliff to come after you. I know him, Galtero whispered. What? How? Earlier today, when I was picking up witnesses, I came across this man. I was going to bring him to you for questioning, but those two big guards showed up and carried him off. Unfortunate. It would have been... The hush of the room caused Tobias to look up. Lord Rahl was staring at him. It was like looking into the penetrating gray-eyed glare of a raptor. Lord Rahl's eyes shifted to Lunetta. She stood frozen in the light of his gaze. Surprisingly, a small smile came to his lips. Of all the women at the ball, Lord Rahl said to her, your dress is the prettiest. Lunetta beamed. Tobias almost laughed out loud. Lord Rahl had just delivered a cutting message to the others in the room. Their social status counted for nothing with him. Tobias was suddenly beginning to enjoy himself. Perhaps the order would not be so poorly served with a man like this among their leaders. The Imperial Order, Lord Rahl began, believes that the time has come for the world to be united under a common canon, theirs. They say that magic is responsible for all man's failings, misfortunes, and troubles. They claim all evil to be the external influence of magic. They say the time has come for magic to pass from the world. Some in the room murmured their agreement. Some grumbled their skepticism, but most stood mute. Lord Rahl laid an arm across the top of the largest chair, the one in the center. In order for their vision to be complete, and in light of their self-proclaimed divine cause, they will suffer the sovereignty of no land. They wish for all to be brought under their influence and to go forward into the future as one people, subjects of the imperial order. He paused for a moment as he met the gaze of many in the crowd. Magic is not a fount of evil. This is merely an excuse for their actions as they ascend to supremacy. Whispering swept back through the room and low undertones of arguments boiled up. Duchess Lumholtz strode forward, commanding attention. She smiled at Lord Rahl before bowing her head. Lord Rahl, what you say is all very interesting, but the blood of the fold here, she flicked her hand in the direction of Tobias and at the same time cast him an icy glare, say that all magic is spewed forth by the keeper. Brogan neither said anything nor moved. Lord Rahl didn't look in his direction, but instead kept his gaze on the Duchess. A child come anew into the world is magic. Would you call that evil? Lifting an imperious hand, she quieted the crowd at her back. The blood of the fold preaches that magic is created by the keeper himself and thereby can only be evil incarnate. From various areas around the floor and up in the balcony, people shouted their agreement. This time it was Lord Rahl who lifted a hand, bringing them to silence. The keeper is the destroyer, the bane of light and life, the breath of death. As I hear it told, it is the creator through his power and majesty who brings all things to be. Almost as one, the crowd shouted that it was true. In that case, Lord Rahl said, to believe that magic springs from the keeper is blasphemy. Could the keeper create a newborn child? To ascribe the power to create, which is the sole domain of the creator, to the keeper is to grant to the keeper that which is chaste and only the creator's. The keeper cannot create. To hold such a profane belief could only be heresy. Silence fell like a pall over the room. Lord Rahl cocked his head to the Duchess. Did you step forward, my lady, to confess to being a heretic or simply to accuse another of heresy for personal gain? With a face once again as red as her tight lips, she took several steps back to her husband's side. The Duke, his own face no longer calm, shook a finger at Lord Rahl. Tricks with words will not change the fact that the Imperial Order fights the Keeper's evil and has come to unite us against him. They wish only for all people to prosper together. Magic will deny that right to mankind. I am Celtish and proud of it, but it is time to move beyond fragmented and frail land standing alone. We have had extensive talks with the Order, 
and they have proven themselves a civilized and decent lot, interested in joining all lands in peace. A noble ideal, Lord Rahl answered in a quiet tone, one you already had in the unity of the Midlands, yet you threw it away for avarice. The Imperial Order is different. It offers true strength and true lasting peace. Lord Rahl fixed the Duke with a glare. Graveyards rarely breach a peace. He turned his glare on the crowd. Not long ago, an army of the Order swept through the heart of the Midlands, seeking to bring others into their fold. Many joined and swelled their force. A Daharan general named Riggs led them, along with officers of several lands, and was assisted by a wizard Slagel of Celtish blood. Well over 100,000 strong, they bore down on Ebenissia, the crown city of Galia. The Imperial Order bade the people of Ebenissia join them and become subjects of the Order. When called upon to oppose aggression against the Midlands, the people of Ebenissia bravely did so. They refused to abandon their commitment to unity and a common defense that was the Midlands. The Duke opened his mouth to speak, but for the first time, Lord Rahl's voice became menacing in tone and cut off his words. The Galean army defended the city to the last man. The wizard used his power to rent the city walls, and the Imperial Order poured in. Once the greatly outnumbered Galean defenders had been eliminated, the Imperial Order did not occupy the city but instead went through it like a pack of howling animals, raping, torturing, and butchering helpless people. Lord Rahl, his jaw clenched tight, leaned across the desk and pointed a finger at Duke Lumholtz. The Order slaughtered every living person in Ebenissia, the old, the young, the newborn. They impaled defenseless pregnant women in order to kill both mother and unborn child. His face red with rage, he slammed his fist to the desk. Everyone jumped. With that act, the Imperial Order put the lie to anything they say. They have lost the right to tell anyone anything about what is right and what is wicked. They are without virtue. They come for one reason and one reason only, to vanquish and subjugate. They slaughtered the people of Ebenissia to show others what they had to offer anyone who fails to submit. They will not be halted by borders or by reason. Men with the blood of babes on their blades have no ethics. Don't you dare stand there and try to tell me otherwise. The Imperial Order is beyond defense. They have shown the fangs behind their smile, and by the spirits they have lost the right to offer words and have them taken as truth. Taking a calming breath, Lord Rawl straightened. Both those innocents at the points of blades and those at the hilts forfeited much that day. The ones at the points forfeited their lives. The ones at the hilt forfeited their humanity and their right to be heard, much less believed. They have cast themselves and any who join them as my enemy. And who were these troops? Someone else asked. Many were Daharan by your own admission. You lead the Daharans by your own admission. When the boundary came down last spring, the Daharans swept in and committed atrocities much the same as you recount. Though Aidendril was spared that cruelty, many other cities and towns suffered the same fate as Ebenissia, but at the hands of Dahara. Now you ask us to believe you? You are no better. Lord Rahl nodded. What you say about Dahara is true. Dahara was led by my father, Darkin Rahl, who was a stranger to me. He did not raise me or teach me his ways. What he wanted was much the same as the Imperial Order wants to conquer all lands and rule all people. Where the order is a monolithic cause, his was a personal quest. Besides using brute force to obtain his ends, he also used magic, much the same as the order. I stand against everything Dark and Rahl stood for. He would stop at no evil act to have his way. He tortured and killed countless innocent people and suppressed magic so that it could not be used against him the same as the order would do. Then you're the same as he. Lord Rahl shook his head. No, I am not. I do not lust to rule. I take up the sword only because I have the ability to help oppose oppression. I fought on the side of the Midlands against my father. In the end, I killed him for his crimes. When he used his vile magic to return from the underworld, I used magic to stop him and send his spirit back to the Keeper. I used magic again to close a doorway the Keeper was using to send his minions into this world. Brogan ground his teeth. 
He knew from experience that banelings often tried to hide their true nature by regaling you with stories of how valiantly they had fought the Keeper and his minions. He had heard enough of these spurious accounts to recognize them as diversions from the actual evil in the person's heart. The Keeper's followers were often too cowardly to show their true nature, and so hid behind such boasts and concocted tales. In fact, he would have arrived in Adendril sooner had he not come across so many pockets of perversion after he had left Nicobaris. Villages and towns where everyone appeared to be living pious lives turned out to be riddled with wickedness. When some of the more strident defenders of their virtue were put to a proper questioning, they finally confessed their blasphemy. When put to a proper questioning, the names of Streganicha and Banelings who lived in the neighborhood and had seduced them to evil with the use of magic had rolled off their tongues. The only solution had been purification. Whole villages and towns had needed to be put to the torch. Not even a signpost to the keeper's lairs remained. The blood of the fold had done the creator's work, but it had taken time and effort. Seething, Brogan returned his attention to Lord Rawl's words. I take up this challenge only because the sword has been thrust into my hand. I ask that you not judge me by who my father was, but by what I do. I do not slaughter innocent defenseless people. The Imperial Order does. Until I violate the trust of honest people, I have the right to be granted honest judgment. I cannot stand by and watch evil men triumph. I will fight with everything I have, including magic. If you side with these murders, you will find no mercy under my sword. All we want is peace, someone shouted. Lord Rawl nodded. I too wish nothing more than that there were peace, and I could go home to my beloved woods and lead a simple life, but I can't. Any more than we can go back to the simple innocence of our childhood. Responsibility has been thrust upon me. Turning your back on innocence in need of help makes you the attacker's accomplice. It is in the name of the innocent and defenseless that I take up the sword and fight this battle. Lord Rawl returned his arm to the center chair. This is the chair of the Mother Confessor. For thousands of years, the Mother Confessors have ruled the Midlands with a benevolent hand, struggling to hold the lands together, to have all the people of the Midlands live as neighbors in peace, and to let them tend to their own affairs without fear of outside force. He let his gaze roam the eyes watching him. The Council sought to break the unity and peace for which this room, this palace, and this city stand and of which you speak so longingly. They unanimously condemned her to death and had her executed. Lord Rawl slowly drew his sword and laid the weapon at the front edge of the desk where all could see it. I told you I am known by different titles. I am also known as the Seeker of Truth, named so by the first wizard. I carry the Sword of Truth by right. Last night, I executed the council for their treason. You are the representatives of the lands of the Midlands, the Mother Confessor offered you the chance to stand together, and you turned your backs on that offer and on her. A man beyond Tobias's view broke the icy silence. Not all of us approved of the action the Council took. Many of us wished the Midlands to stand. The Midlands will be joined yet again and made stronger for the struggle. Many in the crowd voiced their agreement, vowing to do their best to bring unity again. Others remained silent. It is too late for that. You have had your chance. The Mother Confessor suffered your bickering and intractability. Lord Rawl slammed his sword back into its scabbard. I will not. What are you talking about? Duke Lumholtz asked, irritation embrittling his tone. You're from Dahara. You've no right to tell us how the Midlands will function. The Midlands is our affair. Lord Rawl stood statue still as he directed his soft but commanding voice to the crowd. There is no Midlands. I dissolve it here and now. From now on, each land is on its own. The Midlands is not your toy, nor is it Kelton's, Lord Rawl said. It was the design of Kelton to rule the Midlands. How dare you accuse us of... Lord Rawl held up his hand, bidding silence. You are no more rapacious than some of the others. Many of you were anxious to have the Mother Confessors and Wizards out of your hair so you could carve up the spoils. Lunetta tugged on his arm. True, she whispered. Brogan silenced her with an icy look. The Midlands will not tolerate this interference in our business, another voice called out. I am not here to discuss the governing of the Midlands. I have just told you, the Midlands is dissolved. Lord Rawl regarded the crowd with a glare of such deadly commitment that Tobias had to remind himself to take another breath. 
I am here to dictate the terms of your surrender. The crowd flinched as one. Angry shouts erupted and built until the room roared. Red-faced men swore oaths as they shook their fists. Duke Lumholtz shouted everyone to silence and then turned back to the dais. I don't know what foolish ideas you've gotten into your head, young man, but the Imperial Order is in charge of this city. Many have come to reasonable agreements with them. The Midlands will be preserved, will stand united through the Order, and will never surrender to the likes of Dahara. When the crowd surged toward Lord Rahl, red rods appeared in the moored Sith's hands. The echelon of soldiers drew steel, pikes came down, and the Gar's wings snapped open. The beast snarled, its fangs dripping and its green eyes glowing. Lord Rahl stood like a granite wall. The crowd halted and then receded. Lord Rahl's whole body took on the same tight, dangerous demeanor as his glare. You were offered a chance to preserve the Midlands, and you failed. Dahara has been liberated from the fist of the Imperial Order and holds Aiden Drill. You only think you hold Aiden Drill, the Duke said. We have troops here, as do a great many of the lands, and we're not about to let the city fall. A little late for that, too, Lord Rahl held out a hand. May I introduce General Rybish, the commander of all Daharan forces in this sector. The general, a muscular man with a rust-colored beard and combat scars, stepped up onto the dais, clapping a fist to his heart in salute to Lord Rahl before turning to the people. My troops command and surround Aidendril. My men have been sitting on this city for months now. We are finally free of the grip of the order, and are once again Daharans led by Master Rahl. The Haran troops don't like to be sitting around. If any of you would like a fight, I personally would welcome it, though Lord Rahl has commanded that we not be the ones to start the killing, but if called to defend ourselves, the spirits know we will finish it. I'm bored nearly to death with the tedium of occupation, and I'd much rather have something more interesting to do, something I'm very good at. Each of your lands has detachments of troops stationed to guard your palaces, in my professional judgment, if all of you decided to contest the city with the troops you have at hand and did it in an organized fashion, it would take a day, maybe two, for us to rout them. When it was done, we would have no more troubles. Once battle is at hand, the Harans don't take prisoners. The general stepped back with a bow to Lord Rahl. Everyone started talking at once, some angrily shaking their fists and shouting to be heard. Lord Rahl thrust his hand into the air. Silence! It came almost instantly, and he went on. I have invited you here to hear what I have to say. After you have decided to surrender to Dahara, then I will be interested in what you have to say, not before. The Imperial Order wishes to rule all of Dahara and all of the Midlands. They have lost Dahara. I rule Dahara. They have lost Aidendril. Dahara rules Aidendril. You had a chance at unity, and you squandered it. That chance has passed into history. You now have but two choices. Your first is to choose to side with the Imperial Order. They will rule with an iron fist. You will have no say and no rights. All magic will be exterminated except the magic with which they dominate you. If you live, your lives will be a dark struggle without the spark of hope for freedom. You will be their slaves. Your other choice is to surrender to Dahara. You will follow the law of Dahara. Once you are one with us, you will have a say in those laws. We have no desire to extinguish the diversity that is the Midlands. You will have the right to the fruits of your labor and the right to trade and flourish, as long as you work within the larger context of law and the rights of others. Magic will be protected, and your children will be born into a world of freedom where anything is possible. And once the Imperial Order is exterminated, there will be peace, true peace. There will be a price, your sovereignty. While you will be allowed to maintain your own lands and cultures, you will not be allowed to have standing armies. The only men at arms will be those common to all under the banner of Dahara. This will not be a council of independent lands. Your surrender is mandatory. Surrender is the price each land will pay for peace and the proof of your commitment to it. Much as you all paid a tribute to Aidendril, no land, no people will bear all the burden of freedom. All lands, all people will pay a tax sufficient to see the common defense, and no more. All will pay equally. None will be favored. The room erupted with protests, 
with most claiming it would be robbery of what was theirs. Lord Rahl silenced them with nothing more than his glare. Nothing gained without cost is valued. I was reminded of that fact only today. She was the one we buried. Freedom has a cost and all will bear it, so that all will value and preserve it. The people up in the balcony broke out a near riot, protesting that they were promised gold, that it was theirs, and that they could not afford to pay any tax. Chanting began, demanding the gold be turned over to them. Once more, Lord Rahl held up a hand, commanding silence. The man who promised you gold for nothing is dead. Dig him up and complain to him if you wish. The men who will fight for your freedom will require provisions, and our troops will not steal them. Those of you who can provide food and services will be paid a fair price for your labor and goods. All will participate in attaining freedom and peace, if not with service under arms, then at minimum with a tax to support our troops. All, no matter their means, must have an investment in their freedom and will pay their part. This principle is law and inviolate. If you do not wish to comply, then leave aid and drill and go to the imperial order. You are free to demand gold of them, as it was they who made the promise. I will not keep it for them. You are free to choose with us or against us. If you are with us, then you will help us. Think carefully before you decide to leave, for if you leave and decide later that you would rather not suffer the order any longer, then you will pay double the tax for a period of ten years in order to earn your way back. The crowd in the balconies gasped. A woman on the floor near the front spoke up in a distraught voice. What if we choose neither? It is against our principles to fight. We want to be left alone to go about our lives. What if we choose not to fight, to simply go about our business? Do you arrogantly believe that we want to fight because we would stop the slaughter and you are somehow better because you wish not to? Or that we will carry the load by ourselves so that you too may enjoy the freedom to live by your principles? You can contribute in other ways without taking up a sword, but contribute you must. You can help tend the wounded. You can help the families of men gone to fight. You can help build and maintain roads to get supplies to them. There are any number of ways you can help, but you will help. You will pay the tax, the same as everyone else. There will be no bystanders. If you choose not to surrender, you will stand alone. The order intends to conquer all people and lands. Because there is no other way to stop them, I can intend no less. Sooner or later, you will be ruled by one of us. Pray it is not the order. Those lands that choose not to surrender to us will be placed under blockade and isolated until we have time to invade and conquer you, or the order does. None of our people will be allowed to trade with you under penalty of prosecution for treason, and you will not be allowed to transport trade or travel through our land. The opportunity of surrender I give now carries incentives. You will be able to join us without prejudice or sanctions. Once this peaceful offer to surrender has expired, and it becomes necessary to conquer you, you will be conquered, and you will surrender, but the terms will be harsh. Every one of your people will pay triple the tax for a period of 30 years. It wouldn't be fair to punish future generations for the actions of this. Neighboring lands will prosper and grow while you do not, burdened as you will be with higher costs to your surrender. Your land will eventually recover, but you will probably not live long enough to see it. Be warned. I intend to wipe the butchers called the Imperial Order from the face of the land. If you do more than try to stand aside and are foolish enough to join with them, then you cast your fate with theirs. No mercy will be granted. You can't get away with this, an anonymous voice in the crowd called out. We'll stop you. The Midlands is fragmented and cannot be made whole again, or I would instead join with you. What is past is past and cannot be returned. The spirit of the Midlands will live on with those of us who honor its purpose. The Mother Confessor committed the Midlands to war without mercy against the tyranny of the Imperial Order. Honor her command and the ideals of the Midlands in the only way that will succeed, surrender to Dahara. If you join with the Imperial Order, then you stand against everything the Midlands represented. A force of Galean soldiers, led by the Queen of Galia herself, hunted down the butchers of Ebenissia and killed them to a man. She has shown us all that the Imperial Order is vincible. 
I am engaged to wed the Queen of Galea, Kaelin Amnel, and join her people to mine, and thereby show all that I will not stand for the crimes committed, even if they were committed by Daharan troops. Galea and Dahara will be the first to join in the new union, through Galea's surrender to Dahara. My marriage to her will show all that it will be a union made of mutual respect, demonstrating that it can be done without blood conquest or the lust for power, and instead for strength and a hope of a new and better life. She, no less than I, intends to annihilate the imperial order. She has proven her heart with cold steel. The crowd, both those on the main floor and those in the balcony, started crying out questions and demands. Lord Raoul shouted them down. Enough! The people grudgingly fell silent once more. I have heard all I intend to hear. I have told you the way it will be. Do not mistakenly think I will tolerate the way you behaved as nations of the Midlands. I will not. Until you surrender, you are all potential enemies and will be treated as such. Your troops will at once surrender their weapons one way or another and will not be allowed to leave the custody of the Daharan troops now surrounding your palaces. Each of you will send a small delegation to your homeland to convey my message as I have told it to you today. Don't think to try my patience. Delay could cost you everything. And do not think to wile me out of special conditions. There will be none. Each land, whether large or small, will be treated the same and must surrender. If you choose to surrender, we welcome you with open arms and expect you to contribute to the whole. He looked to the balconies. You too have been charged with a responsibility contribute to our survival or leave the city. I am not pretending it will be easy. We stand against a foe without conscience. The creatures on the poles outside were sent against us. Consider their fate while you think on my words. If you choose to join with the imperial order, then I pray the spirits will be kinder to you in the afterlife than I will be in this. You may go. Chapter 13 the guards crossed their pikes before the door. Lord Rall wishes to speak with you. None of the other guests remained in the room. Brogan had held back to the last in order to see if any would seek a private audience with Lord Rall. Most had left in great haste, but a few had lingered, as Brogan had thought they would. Their polite inquiries were turned away by the guards. The balconies, too, had been emptied. Brogan and Galtero, with Lunetta between, crossed the expanse of marble to the dais, accompanied by their footsteps echoing around the dome along with the metallic clatter of the armor from the guards behind them. Lamplight cast a warm glow in the immense, ornate stone room. Lord Raal leaned back in the chair to the side of the Mother Confessor's chair and watched them come. Most of the Daharan soldiers had been dismissed, along with the guests. General Rybish stood to the side of the dais, his face grim. The two huge guards to the ends and the three moored Sith beside Lord Rall watched too, with the silent intensity of coiled vipers. The guard towered behind the chairs, watching with glowing green eyes as they came to a halt before the desk. You may go, General Rybish said to the remaining soldiers. After clapping a fist to their hearts, they departed. After Lord Rall had watched the tall double doors close, he looked to Galtero, Brogan, and then let his gaze settle on Lunetta. Welcome. I am Richard. What is your name? Lunetta Lord Rao. She giggled as she performed an unpractised curtsy. Lord Rao's gaze shifted to Galtero, and Galtero shifted his weight to his other foot. I apologize, Lord Rao, for nearly trampling you today. Apology accepted. Lord Rao smiled to himself. See how easy that was? Galtero said nothing. Lord Rall at last looked to Brogan, his expression turning serious. Lord General Brogan, I want to know why you have been abducting people. Tobias spread his hands. Abducting people? Lord Rall, we have done no such thing, nor would we. I doubt you are a man who tolerates evasive answers, General Brogan. We have that in common. Tobias cleared his throat. Lord Rall, there must be some misunderstanding. When we arrived here in Aidendril in order to offer our assistance to the cause of peace, we found the city be in disarray and matters of authority in a state of confusion. We invited a few people to our palace in order to help determine what dangers be about, nothing more. 
Lord Ra leaned forward. About the only thing you were interested in was the execution of the Mother Confessor. Why would that be? Tobias shrugged. Lord Ra, you must realize that my whole life, the Mother Confessor be the figure of authority in the Midlands. To come to find she may have been executed disturbs me greatly. Nearly half the city witnessed the execution and could have told you so. Why did you think it necessary to abduct people off the street to question them about it? Well, people sometimes have different versions of events when asked separately. They remember events in different ways. An execution is an execution. What is there to remember differently? Well, from across a square, how could you tell who it was being led to the block? Only a few people near the front could have seen her face. And many of those would not know the face as hers even if they did see it. Lord Raoul's eyes weren't losing their dangerous set, so he quickly went on. You see, Lord Raoul, I had been hoping that the whole thing might have been a deception. Deception? The people assembled saw the mother confessor beheaded, Lord Raoul stated flatly. Sometimes people see what they think they will see. It be my hope that they did not really see the mother confessor executed, but perhaps just a show so that she could escape. At least that be my hope. The mother confessor stands for peace. It would be a great symbol of hope for the people if the mother confessor were still alive. We need her. I was going to offer her my protection if she be alive. Put the hope from your mind and dedicate yourself to the future. But surely, Lord Raal, you must have heard the rumors of her escape. I have heard no such rumors. And did you know the Mother Confessor? Brogan let an agreeable smile come to his lips. Oh, yes, Lord Raal. Quite well, in fact. She visited Nakobaris on any number of occasions, as we be a valued member of the Midlands. Really? Lord Raal's face was unreadable as he looked down from behind the desk. What did she look like? She was... well, she had... Tobias frowned. He had met her, but strangely he suddenly realized he couldn't recall what she looked like. Well, she is difficult to describe, and I am not good with that sort of thing. What was her name? Her name? Yes, her name. You said you knew her well. What was her name? Well, it was... Tobias frowned again. How could this be? He was chasing a woman who was the scourge of the pious, the symbol of the magic suppression of the devout, a woman he hungered to judge and punish more than any of the keeper's other disciples, and suddenly he couldn't remember what she looked like, or even her name. Confusion tumbled through his thoughts as he struggled to bring her looks to mind. Suddenly it came to him, the death spell. Lunetta had said that in order for it to work, he probably wouldn't recognize her. It hadn't occurred to him that the spell would erase even her name, but that had to be the explanation. Tobias shrugged as he smiled. I'm sorry, Lord Raal, but with the things you had to say tonight, my mind seems to be in a scramble. He chuckled as he tapped the side of his forehead. I guess I'm getting old and addled, forgive me. You abduct people off the street to question them about the Mother Confessor because you were hoping to find her alive so you can protect her, yet you can't recall what she looks like or even her name? I hope you can appreciate, General, that from my side of the desk, addled would be a lenient representation. I must insist that, like her name, you forget this foolish, ill-advised quest and put your mind to the matter of the future of your people. Brogan could feel his cheek twitch as he spread his hands again. But Lord Raal, don't you see? If the Mother Confessor were to be discovered alive, then it would be a great aid to you in your efforts. If she lives and you could convince her of your sincerity and the necessity of your plan, she would be an invaluable aid to you. If she went along with your demands, then it would carry great weight with the people of the Midlands. Despite what it would appear because of the unfortunate actions of the Council, which in all honesty set my blood to boiling, many in the Midlands greatly respect her and would be swayed by her endorsement. It might even be possible, and a great coup, if you were to convince her to marry you. I am committed to wed the Queen of Galia. Even so, if she were alive, she could help you. Brogan stroked the scar at the side of his mouth as he fixed his eyes on the man behind the desk. Do you think it possible, Lord Rao, that she be alive? 
I was not here at the time, but I am told that perhaps thousands of people saw her beheaded. They think she is dead. While I admit that were she alive, she would be an invaluable help as my ally, that is not the point. The point is, are you able to offer me one good reason why all those people are wrong? Well, no, but I think... Lord Rawls slammed a fist to the desk. Even the two huge guards jumped. I've had enough of this. Do you think I am stupid enough to be diverted from the cause of peace by this speculation? Do you think I will grant you some special privilege because you would think to offer me suggestions to win over the people of the Midlands? I told you there are no special favors. You will be treated the same as every other land. Tobias licked his lips. Of course, Lord Rawl. That wasn't my intention. If you continue on with this quest to find a woman whom thousands saw beheaded at the expense of your charge to chart the future course of your land, then you are going to end up on the point of my sword. Tobias bowed. Of course, Lord Raal. We will leave at once for our homeland with your message. You are doing no such thing. You are going to remain right here. But I must deliver your message to the king. Your king is dead. Lord Raal cocked an eyebrow. Or did you mean that you were going to go chasing his shadow, too, in the belief that he might be hiding out with a mother confessor? Lunetta chuckled. Brogan darted her a glance, and the laugh cut off abruptly. Brogan realized his smile had vanished. He managed to bring a hint of it back. A new king will no doubt be named. That is the way of our land, to be led by a king. It was to him, the new king, that I was going to take the message, Lord Raoul. Since any king that was named would no doubt be your puppet, the journey is unnecessary. You will remain at your palace until you decide to accept my terms and surrender. Brogan's smile widened. As you wish, Lord Rao. He began to draw his knife from the sheath at his belt. Instantly, one of the moored Sith had a red rod an inch from his face. He froze. Looking up into her blue eyes, he feared to move. A custom of my land, Lord Rao. I meant no threat. I was going to surrender my knife to you to show my intent to comply with your wishes and remain at the palace. It be a way of giving my word, a symbol of my sincerity. Would you permit me? The woman didn't take her blue eyes from his. It's all right, Berdine, Lord Rawl said to the woman. She withdrew, but only with great reluctance and a venomous glare. Brogan slowly pulled the knife free and gently placed it, handle first, on the edge of the desk. Lord Rawl took the knife and set it aside. Thank you, General. Brogan held his hand out, palm up. What's this? The custom, Lord Rao. In my land, the custom is that when you ceremonially surrender your knife, in order to avoid dishonor, the person you surrender it to gives you a coin in return. Silver for silver, as a symbolic act of goodwill and peace. Lord Rao, his eyes never leaving Brogan, considered it a moment, and at last leaned back and drew a silver coin from his pocket. He slid it across the desk. Brogan reached up, took the coin, and then slipped it into his coat pocket. But not before he saw the strike, the Palace of the Prophets. Tobias bowed. Thank you for honoring my customs, Lord Rao. If there is nothing else, then I will retire to consider your words. As a matter of fact, there is one more thing. I heard that the blood of the fold holds no favor with magic. He leaned a little closer. So why is it you have a sorceress with you? Brogan looked over at the squat figure beside him. Lunetta? Why, she be my sister, Lord Rawl. She travels with me everywhere. I love her dearly, gift and all. If I were you, I would not put great weight to the words of Duchess Lumholtz. She be Celtish, and I hear they be thick with the order. I have heard it elsewhere, too, from those who are not Celtish. Brogan shrugged. He wished he could get his hands on that cook so he could cut out her wagging tongue. You have asked to be judged by your actions and not by what others say of you. Would you deny me the same? What you hear is beyond my control, but my sister has the gift and I would not have it otherwise. Lord Ra leaned back in his chair, his eyes as penetrating as ever. There were blood of the fold among the Imperial Order's army that butchered those at Ebenissia, as well as the Harans. Brogan lifted an eyebrow. Those who attacked Ebenissia are all dead. The offer you made tonight is to be a fresh start, is it not? Everyone given the opportunity to make the commitment to your offer of peace. Page 122. 
Lord Rahl nodded slowly. It is. One last thing, General. I have fought the Keeper's minions, and I will continue to do so. In doing battle with them, I have discovered that they don't need shadows to conceal them. They can be the last person you would expect, and worse, can do the Keeper's bidding without even realizing they are doing so. Brogan bowed his head. I too have heard it so. Make sure the shadow you chase is not the one you cast. Brogan frowned. He had heard a great many things from Lord Rahl that he did not like, but this was the first he did not understand. I am very sure of the evil I pursue, Lord Rahl. Fear not for my safety. Brogan began to turn away, but then halted and looked over his shoulder. And may I offer my congratulations to you on your engagement to the Galean Queen? I do believe I am becoming addled. I can't seem to keep names in my head. Forgive me, what was her name? Queen Caelan Amnell, Brogan bowed. Of course, Caelan Amnell. I will not forget it again. Chapter 14 Richard stared at the tall mahogany door after it had closed. It was refreshing to see a person with such a guileless nature that she would come to the confessor's palace among so many important finely dressed people wearing an outfit made of tattered patches of different colored cloth. Everyone must have thought her mad. Richard looked down at his simple, filthy clothes. He wondered if they thought him mad, too. Maybe he was. Lord Rahl, Kara said, how did you know she was a sorceress? She was shrouded in her han. Couldn't you see it in her eyes? Her red leather creaked as she leaned a hip against the desk beside him. We would know a woman to be a sorceress if she tried to use her power on us, but not before. What is han? Richard wiped a hand across his face as he yawned. Her inner power, the force of life, her magic. Kara shrugged. You have magic so you could see it. We could not. His thumb stroked the hilt of his sword as he answered with an absent grunt. Over time, without realizing it, he had come to an awareness of the aspect of magic in a person. If they were using their magic, he could usually see it in their eyes. Though singular to each person, or perhaps the specific nature of their magic, there was a commonality Richard could recognize. Maybe, as Kara said, it was because he had the gift, or maybe it was simply the experience of having seen the distinctive, timeless look in the eyes of so many people with magic. Kaelin, Adi the Bone Woman, Shota the Witch Woman, Dushailu the Spirit Woman of the Bakaban Mana, Darken Rahl, Sister Verna, Prelate Annalena, and countless other Sisters of the Light. The Sisters of the Light were sorceresses, and he had often seen the unique glaze of distant intensity in their eyes when they were joined with their Han. Sometimes, when they were enveloped in a shroud of magic, he could almost see the air about them crackle. There were sisters who seemed to radiate an aura of such power, that when they walked past him, the fine hairs at the back of his neck stood on end. Richard had seen the same look in Lunetta's eyes. She had been shrouded in her Han. What he didn't know was why. Why she would be standing there, doing nothing, yet touching her Han. Sorceresses usually didn't let their Han envelop them unless it was to a purpose. The same way he usually didn't draw his sword and its attendant magic without a reason. Maybe it simply pleased her childlike temper, the way those patches of colored cloth did. Richard didn't think so. What concerned him was that it could have been that Lunetta was trying to ascertain if he was telling the truth. He didn't know enough about magic to know for sure if that was possible, but sorceresses often seemed somehow to know if he was being truthful, making it seem that every time he told a lie, it couldn't have been any more obvious to them had his hair suddenly burst into flames. He hadn't wanted to take a chance, and had been careful not to be caught in a lie in front of Lunetta, especially about Kaelin being dead. Brogan had certainly been interested in the Mother Confessor. Richard wished he could believe he was telling the truth. What he had said made enough sense. Maybe it was just his concern for Kaelin's safety that made him suspicious of everything. That man looks like trouble waiting to find a roost, he said aloud without intending to. Would you like us to clip his wings, Lord Rahl? Berdine flicked her aegeal on the end of the chain at her wrist and caught it in her fist. She cocked an eyebrow. Maybe something a little lower? The other two moored Sith chuckled. No, Richard said in a tired voice. I've given my word. 
I've asked them all to do something unprecedented, something that will forever change their lives. I have to do as I said I would and give them all the chance to see that this is right, that it's for the common good, the best chance for peace. Gratch yawned, showing his fangs, and sat down on the floor behind Richard's chair. Richard hoped the gar wasn't as tired as he was. Ulick and Egan seemed to ignore the conversation. They stood, relaxed, with their hands clasped behind their backs. They seemed to be a match for some of the pillars around the room. Their eyes were not relaxed, however. They constantly surveyed the columns, corners, and alcoves, watching, even though the huge room was empty except for the eight of them around the ornate dais. With a meaty thumb, General Rybish idly burnished the bulbous gold base of a lamp at the edge of the dais. Lord Rall, did you mean what you said about the men not taking what they've won? Richard looked at the general's troubled eyes. Yes, that's the way of our enemies and not ours. We fight for freedom, not plunder. The general averted his eyes as he nodded his assent. Do you have something to say about that, general? No, Lord Rall. Richard flopped back in his chair. General Rybish... I've been a woods guide since I was old enough to be trusted. I've never had to command an army before. I'll be the first to admit that I don't know much about the position I find myself in. I could use your help. My help? What sort of help, Lord Rall? I could use your experience. I would appreciate it if you expressed your opinion instead of holding it back and saying, yes, Lord Rall. I may not agree with you and I may get angry, but I'll never punish you for telling me what you think. If you disobey my orders, I'll replace you, but you're free to say what you think of them. That's one of the things we're fighting for. The general clasped his hands behind his back. The muscles of his arms glistened under the chain mail, and Richard could see, too, under the rings of metal, the white scars of his rank. The Haran troops have a custom of plundering those we defeat. The men expect it. Past leaders may have tolerated it or even encouraged it, but I will not. His sigh was comment enough to understand. As you wish, Lord Rall. Richard rubbed his temples. He had a headache from lack of sleep. Don't you understand? This isn't about conquering lands and taking things from others. This is about fighting oppression. The general rested a boot on the gilded rung of a chair and hooked a thumb behind his wide belt. I don't see much difference. From my experience, the master Rall always thinks he knows best and always wants to rule the world. You are your father's son. War is war. Reasons make no difference to us. We fight because we are told to, same as those on the other side. Reasons mean little to a man swinging his sword, trying to keep his head. Richard slammed a fist to the desk. Gratch's glowing green eyes became alert. In his peripheral vision, Richard could see red leather moving protectively closer. The men who went after the butchers of Ebenicia had a reason. That reason and not plunder, was what sustained them and gave them the strength they needed in order to prevail. They were a detachment of 5,000 Galean recruits who had never before been in battle, and yet they defeated General Riggs and his army of over 50,000 men. General Rybish's heavy brow drew together. Recruits? Surely you're mistaken, Lord Rall. I knew Riggs. He was an experienced soldier. Those were battle-hardened troops. I have received reports from the site of those battles. They are grisly in the detail of what happened to those men as they tried to fight their way out of the mountains. They could only have been annihilated in such a fashion by an overwhelming force. Then I guess Riggs wasn't as experienced a soldier as he needed to be. While you have second-hand reports, I heard the story from an unimpeachable source who was there to see it done. 5,000 men, boys really, came upon Ebenicia after Riggs and his men were finished butchering the women and children. Those recruits pursued Riggs and took his army down. When it was finished, less than a thousand of those young men were left standing, but not Riggs nor a single one of his force was left alive. Richard left unsaid that without Kalin there to teach them what needed to be done and lead them into the first battles, directing them in the forge of combat, those recruits probably would have been ground into carrion within a day. At the same time, he knew it was their commitment to see the job done that gave them the courage to listen to her and to go up against impossible odds. That is the power of motivation, General. That is what men can do when they have a powerful reason, a righteous cause. 
A sour expression puckered his scarred face. The Harans have been fighting most of their lives and know what they're about. War is about killing. You kill them before they can kill you. That's all. Whoever wins is the one who was right. Reasons are the spoils of victory. When you've destroyed the enemy, then your leaders write down the reasons in books and give moving speeches about them. If you've done your job, then there aren't any of the enemy left to dispute your leader's reasons, at least not until the next war. Richard raked his fingers through his hair. What was he doing? What did he think he could accomplish if those fighting on his own side didn't believe in what he was trying to do? Overhead, across the plastered ceiling of the dome, the painted figure of Magda Cirrus, the first mother confessor, Kalin had told him, and her wizard, Merritt, looked down on him. In disapproval, it seemed. General, what I was trying to do tonight, talking to those people, was about trying to stop the killing. I'm trying to make it possible for peace and freedom to have a chance to take root for good. I know it sounds a paradox, but don't you see? If we behave with honor, then all those lands with integrity who want peace and freedom will join us. When they see we fight to stop the fighting, and not simply to conquer and dominate or for plunder, they will be on our side, and the forces of peace will be invincible. For now the aggressor makes the rules, and our only choice is to fight or submit, but... He sighed in frustration as he thumped his head back against the chair. He closed his eyes. He couldn't bear to meet the gaze of the wizard Merritt overhead. Merritt looked as if he were about to launch into a lecture on the folly of presumption. He had just publicly declared his intention to rule the world, and for reasons his own followers thought were empty talk. He was suddenly beginning to feel hopelessly foolish. He was just a woods guide turned seeker, not a ruler. Just because he had the gift, he was starting to think he could make a difference. Gift. He didn't even know how to use his gift. How could he be so arrogant as to think this would work? He was so tired he couldn't think straight. He couldn't remember the last time he had slept. He didn't want to rule anyone. He just wanted it all to stop so he could be with Kalin and live his life without any fighting. The night before with her had been bliss. That was all he wanted. General Rybish cleared his throat. I've never fought for anything before, any reason, I mean, other than my bond. Maybe it's time I tried it your way. Richard came off the back of the chair and frowned at the man. Are you just saying that because you think that's what I want to hear? Well, the general said as he picked with a thumbnail at the carvings of acorns along the edge of the desk. The spirits know no one would believe this, but soldiers want peace more than most people, I'd expect. We just don't dare to dream about it because we see so much killing that we get to thinking it can't ever end. And if you dwell on it, you'll get soft. And getting soft gets you killed. If you act like you're keen for a fight, it gives your enemies pause, lest they give you a reason. Like the paradox you spoke of. Seeing all that fighting and killing makes you wonder if there's anything to you but doing as you're bidden and killing people. Makes you wonder if you're some kind of monster, good for nothing else. Maybe that's what happened to those men who attacked Ebenezer. Maybe they just finally gave in to the voice in their head. Maybe, like you say, if we can do this, the killing would finally stop. He pressed back a long splinter he had worked loose. I guess a soldier always hopes that once he kills all the people who want to kill him, then he can try laying down his sword. The spirits know that no one hates fighting more than many of those who have to do it. He let out a long sigh. Ah, but no one would believe that. Richard smiled. I believe it. The general glanced up. It's rare to find someone who understands the true cost of killing. Most either glorify or are repelled by it, never feeling the pain of infliction and the agony of responsibility. You're good at killing. I'm glad you don't relish it. Richard's gaze left the general and sought the consoling gloom of the shadows among the arches between marble columns. As he had told the assembled representatives, he was named in prophecy. In one of the oldest prophecies, in High Daharan, he was called Fuergrisa Ostdrauka, the bringer of death. He was thrice named. The one who could bring the place of the dead and the world of the living together by tearing the veil to the underworld. The one who brought the spirits of the dead forth, which he did when he used the magic of a sword and danced with death. And in its most base meaning, one who kills. 
Berdine clapped Richard on the back, jarring his teeth and breaking the uncomfortable silence. You didn't tell us you had found yourself a bride. I hope you plan on a bath before the wedding night or she'll turn you out. The three women laughed. Richard was surprised to find he had the energy to grin. I'm not the only one who smells like a horse. If there is nothing else, Lord Rall, I'd best see to a number of matters. General Rybish straightened and scratched his rust-colored beard. Just how many people do you expect there are will have to kill to have this peace you speak of? He smiled crookedly. So I can know how much farther there is to go before I don't have to have guards watch my back when I lie down for a snooze. Richard shared a long look with the man. Maybe they'll come to their senses and surrender, and we won't have to fight. General Rybish grunted a cynical laugh. If you don't mind, I think I'll have the men sharpen their swords, just in case. He peered up. Do you know how many lands there are in the Midlands? Richard thought it over a moment. As a matter of fact, I don't. Not all the lands are large enough to be represented in Aidendrill, but many of those are still large enough to have men-at-arms. The Queen will know. She'll join us soon and be able to help. Tiny specks of lamplight danced off his chainmail. I'll start sweeps through the palace guard forces at once tonight before they have a chance to organize. Maybe it'll be nice and peaceful that way. I expect that before the night's over, though, at least one of the guard forces will try to bolt. Make sure there are enough men around the Nakobari's palace. I don't want Lord General Brogan leaving the city. I don't trust that man. But I've given my word that he will have the same chance as all the rest. I'll see to it. And General, have the men be careful of his sister Lunetta. Richard felt an odd sympathy for Tobias Brogan's sister, for her innocent seeming heart. He liked her eyes. He steeled himself. If they come out of their palace, intending to leave, have plenty of archers at strategic locations and in range. If she uses magic, don't take any chances by delay. Richard already hated this. He had never had to commit men to a battle in which people could easily be hurt or killed. He remembered what the prelate had once told him. Wizards had to use people to do what must be done. General Rybish eyed the silent Ulick and Egan, the Gar, and the three women. He spoke to them past Richard. A thousand men will be wide awake and a shout away if you need them. Kara's expression sobered after the general had gone. You must sleep, Lord Rall. As Mord Sith, I know when a man is exhausted and about to fall over. You can make your plans to conquer the world tomorrow after you have rested. Richard shook his head. Not yet. I have to write her a letter first. Berdine leaned against the desk beside Kara and folded her arms. A love letter to your bride? Richard pulled open a drawer. Something like that. Berdine put on a coy smile. Maybe we can help. We will tell you the proper things to say to keep her heart pounding and forget you need a bath. Raina joined her sisters of the Aegeal against the desk, adding an impish laugh that sparkled in her dark eyes. We will give you lessons in being a proper mate. You and your queen will be happy to have us around for advice. And you had better listen to us, Berdine cautioned. Or we will teach her how to make you dance to her tune. Richard tapped Berdine's leg, urging her to move aside so he could get at the drawers behind her. He found paper in the bottom one. Why don't you go get some sleep, he said absently as he searched for a pen and ink. You were riding hard, too, trying to catch me, and couldn't have gotten much more sleep than I did. Kara turned her nose up in mock indignation. We will stand watch while you sleep. Women are stronger than men. Richard remembered Denna telling him that very thing, only she hadn't been playful when she said it. These three never let their guard down when anyone was around. He was the only one they trusted when they wanted to practice their social graces. He thought they needed a lot of practice. Maybe that was why they wouldn't give up their Aegeal. They had never been anything but Mord Sith and were afraid they wouldn't be able to do it. Kara leaned over, looking in the empty drawer before he pushed it shut. She flicked her blonde braid back over her shoulder. She must care greatly for you, Lord Rall, if she is willing to surrender her land to you. I don't know if I would do such a thing for a man, even if he was one such as you. He would have to be the one to surrender to me. Richard made her scoot aside and at last found pens and ink in a drawer he would have opened first had she not been in the way. You're right, she cares greatly for me. But as to surrendering her land, well, I haven't told her that part yet. Kara's arms unfolded. 
You mean to say that you have yet to demand her surrender? As you have done tonight with the others? Richard wiggled the stopper from the ink bottle. That's one reason I must write this letter at once, to explain my plan to her. Why don't you three be quiet and let me write? Raina, a look of true concern in her dark eyes, squatted beside his chair. What if she calls off the wedding? Queens are proud. She may not wish to do such a thing. A ripple of worry surged through his gut. It was worse than that. These women didn't really understand what he was asking Kalen to do. He was not asking a queen to surrender her land. He was asking the mother confessor to surrender all of the Midlands. She is as committed to defeating the Imperial Order as am I. She has fought with determination that would make a moored Sith blanch. She wishes the killing to stop as much as do I. She loves me and will understand the benevolence of what I'm asking. Raina sighed. Well, if she doesn't, we will protect you. Richard fixed her with such a deadly glare that she rocked back on her heels as if he had struck her. Don't you ever, ever even think of harming Kalen. You will protect her the same as you would me, or you can leave right now and join the ranks of my enemies. You are to hold her life as dear as mine. Swear it on your bond to me. Swear it. Raina swallowed. I swear it, Lord Thrall. He glared at the other two women. Swear it. I swear it, Lord Ral, they said together. He looked to Ulick and Egan. I swear it, Lord Ral, they said as one. He let slip his belligerent tone. All right, then. Richard placed the paper on the desk before himself and tried to think. Everyone thought she was dead. This was the only way. They couldn't let people know she was alive or someone might try to finish what the council had thought they had accomplished. She would understand if he could just explain it properly. Richard could feel the figure of Magda Cirrus overhead, glaring down at him. He feared to look up lest her wizard Merit send down a bolt of lightning to punish him for what he was doing. Kaelin had to believe him. She had told him once that she would die to protect him if necessary, in order to save the Midlands, that she would do anything. Anything. Kara sat back on her hands. Is the queen pretty? Her mischievous smile returned. What does she look like? She won't try to make us wear dresses once you're married, will she? We'll obey her, but Mord Sith don't wear dresses. Richard sighed inwardly. They were only trying to lighten the mood by acting mischievous. He wondered how many people these mischievous women had killed. He reprimanded himself. That wasn't fair, especially coming from the bringer of death. One of them had died this very day trying to protect him. Poor Halley never had a chance against a Mriswith. Neither would Kalin. He had to help her. This was the only thing he could think of, and every minute that passed could be a minute too late. He had to hurry. He tried to think of what to say. He couldn't let it out that Queen Kalin was really the mother confessor. If the letter fell into the wrong hands... Richard looked up when he heard the door squeak open. Berdine, where do you think you're going? To find a bed of my own. We will take turns standing watch over you. She put one hand on a hip, and with the other spun the Aegeal on the chain at her wrist. Control yourself, Lord Nural. You will have a new bride in your bed soon enough. You can wait until then. Richard couldn't help smiling. He liked Berdine's wry sense of humor. General Rybish said there were a thousand men standing guard. There is no need, Berdine winked. Lord Rall, I know you like me the best, but stop thinking about my behind as I walk and write your letter. Richard tapped the glass-handled pen against a tooth as the door closed. Kara's brow wrinkled in a frown. Lord Rall, do you think that the Queen will be jealous of us? Why should she be jealous? He mumbled as he scratched the back of his neck. She has no reason. Well, don't you think we're attractive? Richard blinked up at her. He pointed at the door. Both of you go stand by the doors and make sure no one can get in here and kill your Lord Rall. If you're quiet, like Egan and Ulick here, and let me write this letter, you may remain on this side of the door. If not, then you will guard from the other side. They rolled their eyes, but both had smiles as they headed across the room, apparently enjoying the fact that their nettling had finally gotten a reaction from him. He guessed Mord Sith must be hungry for playful banter. It was something they got precious little of, but he had more important things on his mind. Richard stared at the blank piece of paper and tried to think through the haze of weariness. 
Gratch put a furry paw on his leg and snuggled against his side as Richard dipped the pen in the ink bottle. My dearest queen, he began with one hand, while patting the paw in his lap with the other. Chapter 15 Tobias scanned the snowy darkness as they slogged through the deepening drifts. Are you sure you did as I instructed? Yes, my Lord General, I told you they be spelled. Behind, the lights of the Confessor's Palace and the surrounding buildings of the city center had long ago faded into the swirling snowstorm that had swept down out of the mountains while they had been inside listening to Lord Rao deliver his absurd demands to the representatives of the Midlands. Then where are they? If you lose them and they freeze to death out here, I will be more than displeased with you, Lunetta. I know where they be, Lord General, she insisted. I will not lose them. She stopped and lifted her nose, sniffing the air. This way. Tobias and Galtero looked at each other and frowned, then turned to follow her as she hurried off into the darkness behind King's Row. Occasionally, he could just make out the dark shapes of the palaces looming in the storm. They provided ghosts of lights and guidance in the directionless void of falling snow. In the distance, he could hear the passing clank of armor. It sounded like more men than a simple patrol. Before the night was out, the Daharans would probably make a move to consolidate their grip on Aidendril. That's what he would do if he were in their place. Strike before your opponents have time to digest their options. Well, no matter. He wasn't planning on staying. Tobias blew the snow from his mustache. You were listening to him, weren't you? Yes, Lord General, but I told you I could not tell. He be no different than anyone else. You must not have been paying attention. I knew you weren't paying attention. You were scratching your arms and you weren't paying attention. Lunetta cast him a quick look over her shoulder. He be different. I do not know why, but he be different. I have never felt magic like his before. I could not tell if he be telling every word true or every word a lie. But I think he be telling it true. She shook her head to herself in wonder. I can get past blocks. I always can get past blocks. Any kind. Air, water, earth, fire, ice, any kind. Even spirit. But his. Tobias smiled absently. It didn't matter. He didn't need her filthy taint to tell. He knew. She mumbled on about the strange aspects of Lord Rawls' magic and how she wanted away from it, away from this place, and how it made her skin itch like never before. He only half listened. She would have her wish to be away from Aidendril after he took care of a few matters. What are you sniffing at? he growled. Midden, my Lord General, kitchen midden. Tobias gripped a fistful of her colored rags. Midden? You left them at a midden heap? She grinned as she waddled along. Yes, Lord General. You said you didn't want people around. I not be familiar with the city and did not know a safe place I could send them. But I saw the Midden Heap on our way to the Confessor's Palace. No one will be there in the night. Midden Heap, Tobias harumphed. Looney Lunetta, he muttered. She lost a stride. Please, Tobias, do not call me. Then where are they? She lifted her arm, pointing, and hurried her step. This way, Lord General. You will see, this way, not far. He thought about it as he trudged through the drifts. It made sense. It did make sense. A midden heap was the perfect justice. Lunetta, you be telling me the truth about Lord Raal, aren't you? If you lie to me about this, I will never forgive you. She stopped and looked up at him. Tears welled in her eyes as she clutched her colored rags. Yes, my Lord General, please. I be telling the truth. I tried everything. I tried my best. Tobias stared at her a long moment as a tear ran down her plump cheek. It didn't matter. He knew. He flicked his hand impatiently. All right, then, get going. You better not have lost them. Suddenly beaming, she wiped her cheek, turned back to the way she had been going, and darted off. This way, Lord General. You will see. I know where they be. Sighing, Tobias started after her again. The snow was piling up, and at the rate it was coming down, it looked like it was going to be a bad one. No matter. Things were turning his way. Lord Rahl was a fool if he thought Lord General Tobias Brogan of the Blood of the Fold was going to surrender like a baneling under hot iron. Lunetta was pointing. Over here, Lord General. They be here. Even with the wind howling at their backs, Tobias could smell the midden heap before he could see it. He shook the snow off his crimson cape when they reached the dark hump 
lit by the faint lights from palaces beyond the wall in the distance. The snow melted off in places as it fell on the steaming heap, leaving much of its dark shape devoid of even the pretense of purity. He put his fists on his hips. So, where are they? Lunetta moved close to his side, hiding herself in his lee from the wind-driven snow. Stand here, Lord General. They will come to you. He looked down and saw a well-trodden path. A circle spell. She cackled softly as she pulled some scraps up around her red cheeks against the cold. Yes, Lord General. You said you did not want them to get away, or you would be angry with me. I did not want you to be angry with Lunetta, so I cast them a circle spell. They cannot get away now, no matter how fast they go. Tobias smiled. Yes, the day was ending well after all. It had provided obstacles, but with the Creator's guidance, he would overcome them. Now matters were in his command. Lord Rawl was going to find out that no one dictated to the blood of the fold. Emerging from the darkness, he first saw the swish of her yellow skirts as her wrap was pulled open by a gust. Duchess Lumholtz, the Duke a half-step behind and to her side, trod purposefully toward him. When she saw who was standing beside the path, a glower darkened her painted face. She tugged closed her snow-encrusted wrap. Tobias greeted her with a broad smile. We meet again. A good evening to you, madam. He tilted his head in a slight nod. And to you too, Duke Lamholtz. The Duchess sniffed her disapproval and lifted her nose. The Duke eyed them with a stern glare, as if he were placing a barrier he defied them to cross. Both marched past without a word and off into the darkness. Tobias chuckled. You see, my Lord General, as I promised, they wait for you. Tobias hooked both thumbs in his belt as he straightened his shoulders, letting his crimson cape billow open in the wind. There was no need to pursue the pair. You did well, Lunetta, he murmured. Before long, the yellow of her skirts appeared again. This time, when she saw Tobias Scaltero and Lunetta standing beside her well-trodden path, a look of shock drew up her eyebrows. She really was an attractive woman, despite the superfluous paint. Not girlish at all, though still young, but mature of face and figure, ripe with the proud poise of full womanhood. With deliberate menace, the Duke rested a steady hand on the hilt of his sword as the pair approached. Though ornate, the Duke's sword, Tobias knew, was like Lord Rawls, not mere decoration. Kelton made some of the best steel in the Midlands, and all Keltons, especially nobility, prided themselves on knowing well its use. General broke, Lord General, madam. She looked down her nose at him. Lord General Brogan, we are on our way home to our palace. I suggest you stop following us and return to yours. It's a foul night to be out. From beside him, Galtero watched the lace at her bosom rise and fall in ire. When she noticed, she snatched her wrap closed. The Duke noticed, too, and leaned toward Galtero. Keep your eyes off my wife, sir, or I'll cut you to pieces and feed you to my hounds. Galtero, a treacherous smile spreading on his lips, looked up at the taller man, but said nothing. The Duchess huffed. Good night, General. The pair marched off again to make another circuit of the midden heap, thoroughly convinced they were heading toward their destination, straight as an arrow flies. But in the haze of a circle spell, they went nowhere except around and around. He could have stopped them the first time, but he relished the consternation in their eyes as they tried to grasp how he could repeatedly show up ahead of them. Their spelled minds would be able to make no sense of it. The next time by, their faces went as white as the snow before flushing to red. The Duchess stomped to a halt and fists on her hips scowled at him. Tobias watched the white lace right in front of his face lift and fall with the heat of her indignation. Look here, you greasy little nick. How dare you? Brogan's jaw locked rigid. With a grunt of rage, he snatched the white lace in both fists and ripped the front of her dress down to her waist. Lunetta's hand lifted, accompanied by a short incantation, and the Duke, his sword halfway out of its scabbard, stopped rigid and unmoving as if turned to stone. Only his eyes moved to see the Duchess cry out as Galtero pinned both her arms behind her back, rendering her as immobile and helpless as he, though without the use of magic. Her back arched as Galtero twisted her arms in his powerful grip. Her nipples stood out stiff in the cold wind. Since he had forfeited his knife, Brogan drew his sword instead. What did you call me, you filthy little whore? Nothing. In the clutch of panic, she threw her head from side to side, her black curls whipping across her face. 
Nothing. My, my, lost your spine so easily. What do you want? She panted. I'm no baneling. Leave me go. I'm no baneling. Of course you be no baneling. You'll be too pompous to be a baneling, but that makes you no less despicable or useful. Then it's him you want? Yes, the Duke. He's the baneling. Leave me go and I'll recount his crimes. Brogan spoke through clenched teeth. The Creator does not be served by false self-serving confessions, but you will serve him nonetheless. His cheek twitched with a grim smile. You will serve the Creator through me. You'll do my bidding. I'll do no such, she cried out as Galtero tightened his grip. Yes, all right, she gasped. Anything. Just don't hurt me. Tell me what you want and I'll do it. She tried unsuccessfully to back away as he put his face within inches of hers. You will do. As I tell you, he said through gritted teeth. Her voice was choked with terror. Yes, all right. You have my word. He sneered derisively. I wouldn't take the word of a whore like you, one who would sell anything, betray any principle. You will do my bidding because you have no choice. He backed away, pinched her left nipple between his thumb and the knuckle of his first finger, and stretched it out. As she wailed, her eyes opened wide. Brogan brought the sword up and with a sawing cut sliced off the nipple. Her scream drowned out the howl of the wind. Brogan placed the severed nipple in Lunetta's upturned palm. Her stubby fingers closed around it as her eyes closed in a shroud of magic. Soft sounds of an ancient incantation melded with the wind and the sound of the Duchess's shivering shrieks. Galtero held her weight as the wind wheeled around them. Lunetta's chanting rose in pitch as she tilted her head up to the inky sky. With her eyes shut tight, she summoned the spell around herself and the woman before her. The wind seemed to pull the words forth as Lunetta conjured in her Straganicha tongue. From earth to sky, from leaves to roots, from fire to ice and soul's own fruits, from light to dark, from wind to water, I claim this spirit and creator's daughter. Till the heart's blood boils or the bones be ash, till the tallow be dust and death's teeth gnash, this one be mine. I cast her gnomon into a sunless glen and pull this soul beyond its umbra's ken. Till her tasks be done and the worms be fed, till the flesh be dust and the soul has fled, this one be mine. Lunetta's voice lowered to a throaty chant. Cock's hen, spider's ten, bizarre then, I make a thrall stew. Ox gall, castor and call, I make a chattel brew. Her words drifted away and were lost in the wind, but her squat body bobbed as she went on, shaking her empty hand over the woman's head and the other with a chunk of flesh over her own heart. The duchess shuddered as tendrils of magic coiled around her, snaking into her flesh. She convulsed as its fangs sank into her very soul. Galtero had all he could do to hold her, until at last she went limp in his grip. Despite the wind, there seemed a sudden silence. Lunetta opened her hand. She be mine to bid. I pass my right to you. She placed the now desiccated knob of flesh in Brogan's upturned palm. She be yours now, my lord general. Brogan closed the shriveled knot in his fist. The duchess hung glassy-eyed by her arms behind her back. Her legs held her weight, but she shook with pain and cold. Blood oozed from her wound. Brogan tightened his fist. Stop that shivering! She looked into his eyes and her glazed expression faded. She became still. Yes, my lord general. Brogan gestured to his sister. Heal her. Galtero watched with a glint of lust in his dark eyes as Lunetta cupped both hands around the woman's injured breast. Duke Lumholtz, too, watched with eyes nearly bulging out of their sockets. Lunetta's eyes closed again as she wove more magic, casting a soft spell. Blood trickled from between Lunetta's fingers until the woman's flesh began drawing together in the healing. Brogan's mind drifted as he waited. The Creator did indeed watch over his own. A day that had started with him at the brink of the greatest of triumphs was brought nearly to ruin. But in the end, he had proven that those who kept the Creator's cause in their hearts could prevail. Lord Rahl was going to find out just what happened to those who worshipped the Keeper, and the Imperial Order was going to find out just how valuable the Lord General of the Blood of the Fold was to them. Galtero, too, had proven his worth this day. The man was entitled to a trifle for his efforts. 
Lunetta used the Duchess's wrap to wipe off the blood, and then withdrew to reveal a perfectly whole breast, as flawless as the other, except it had no nipples. Brogan had that now. Lunetta motioned toward the Duke. Am I to do him too, Lord General? Do you wish to have them both? No. Brogan lifted a hand with a dismissive wave. No, I only need her. But he will play his part in my plan. Brogan fixed his glare on the Duke's panicked eyes. This be a dangerous city. As Lord Rall told us today, there be dangerous creatures about attacking innocent citizens who have no chance against them. Shocking. If only Lord Rall were here to protect the Duke from such an attack. I will see to it at once, Lord General, Galtero said. No, I can take care of this. I thought you might like to entertain the Duchess here while I see to the Duke. Galtero drew teeth across his lower lip as he gazed at the Duchess. Yes, Lord General, very much, thank you. He tossed Brogan his knife. You will need this. The soldiers told me that the creatures disemboweled their victims with a three-bladed knife. You will need to make three slices to duplicate the effect. Brogan thanked his colonel. He could always count on Galtero's thoroughness. The woman's eyes moved back and forth between the three of them, but she said nothing. Would you like me to compel her to cooperate? A gruesome grin spread on Galtero's usually stony face. And what would be the purpose of that, Lord General? Better if she learned another lesson this night. Brogan nodded. As you wish, then, he looked to the Duchess. My dear, I do not bid this of you. You are free to express your own true feelings about it to Galtero here. She cried out when Galtero swept an arm around her waist. Why don't we go over there in the darkness? I would not want to offend your delicate sensibilities, Duchess, by allowing you to see what be happening to your husband. You can't, she cried out. I'll freeze in the snow. I must do my Lord General's bidding. I'll freeze. Galtero patted her bottom. Oh, you won't freeze. The midden will be warm under you. She shrieked and tried to pull away, but Galtero already had a good grip on her. He tightened his other fist in her hair. She be a lovely creature, Galtero. See that that beauty isn't marred, and don't be long. She yet has bidding to do for me. She will have to wear less paint, he said with a smirk. But since she has such talent with it, at least she can paint herself a nipple where her real one be missing. When I be finished with the Duke here, and you be finished with her, then Lunetta has another spell to cast over her. A very special spell. A very rare and powerful spell. Lunetta stroked her pretties as she watched his eyes. She knew what he wanted. Then I will need something of his, something he has touched. Brogan patted his pocket. He accommodated us with a coin. Lunetta nodded. That will do. The Duchess shrieked and flailed her arms as Galtero began dragging her off into the darkness. Brogan turned and waggled the knife in front of the tall Kelton's wild eyes. And now, Duke Lumholtz, on to your part in the Creator's plan. Chapter 16 With Gratch looming over his shoulder watching, Richard dribbled the red wax in a long puddle across the folded letter. He hastily set the candle and wax aside and picked up his sword, rolling the handle into the wax, making an impression of the hilt with its braided gold wire that spelled out the word truth. He was satisfied with the results. Kalin and Zed would know the letter really was his. Egan and Ulick were sitting at the ends of the long curved desk, watching the empty room as if an army were about to storm the dais. His two huge guards preferred to stand. He was sure they must be tired and had insisted they sit. They said standing left them more prepared to react in the event of trouble. Richard had told them that he thought the thousand men outside guarding would probably raise a sufficient racket if there were an attack that the two would notice, even from a seated position, and still have time to get up out of their chairs and draw their swords. It was then that they had reluctantly sat down. Kara and Raina stood beside the doors. When he had told them that they were welcome to sit too, they had dismissed the suggestion with haughty sniffs and had said that they were stronger than Egan and Ulick and would stand. Richard had been in the middle of writing his letter and hadn't wanted to argue with them, so he had said that since they looked tired and slow, he was ordering them to stand so they would have sufficient time to come to his defense in case there was an attack. They were standing now, scowling at him, 
but he had caught glimpses of them smiling to each other, apparently pleased with the way they had been able to draw him into their game. Dark and Rahl had given the moored Sith clearly delineated bounds, master and slave. Richard wondered if they were testing their limits with him, trying to find where the slack ended. Maybe they were simply gleeful to be able, for the first time, to act as they wished, on whim if they wanted. Richard also considered the possibility that their game was a test, to try to ascertain if he was mad. Mord Sith were nothing if not accomplished at testing. It troubled him that they might think him mad. This was the only way. They had to see that. Richard hoped Gratch wasn't as tired as the rest of them. The Gar had only just joined him that morning, so Richard didn't know how much sleep he had gotten. But his glowing green eyes looked bright and alert. Gars hunted mostly at night, so perhaps that explained his wakefulness. Whatever it was, Richard hoped it was true that Gratch wasn't tired and not simply his hope. Richard patted the furry arm. Gratch, come with me. The gar came to his feet, stretched his wings along with one leg, and followed Richard across the expanse of floor to one of the covered stairways up to the balcony. The four guards instantly came alert when Richard started off. He gestured for them to stay where they were. Egan and Ulick did. The two women did not, but instead followed him at a distance. Only the two lamps at the bottom of the covered stairway were lit, leaving the rest a gloomy tunnel. At the top, it opened onto a broad balcony, one side edged with a sinuous mahogany railing overlooking the main floor, and the other bordered by the bottom rim of the dome. Above a low, white marble ledger, round windows half again as tall as he were spaced evenly around the enormous room. Richard looked out one of the windows to a snowy night. Snow, that could be trouble. At the bottom, the window was latched with a brass lever, and to the center of each side it was hinged on massive pins. He tested the lever and found it pivoted smoothly. Richard turned back to his friend. Gratch, I want you to listen to me very carefully. This is important. Gratch nodded in earnest concentration. The two moored Sith watched from the shadows near the top of the stairway. Richard reached out and stroked the long lock of hair hanging on a leather thong around Gratch's neck along with the dragon's tooth. This is a lock of Kalin's hair, Gratch nodded that he understood. Gratch, she's in danger, Gratch frowned. You and I are the only ones who can see the Mriswith coming, Gratch growled and covered his eyes with his claws peeking out between, his sign for the Mriswith. Richard nodded. That's right, Gratch, she has no way to see them coming like you and I do. If they go after her, she won't see them coming. They'll kill her. An uneasy, purling whine rose from Gratch's throat. His face brightened. He held out the lock of Kalin's hair and then thumped his massive chest. Richard couldn't help laughing in wonder at the guard's ability to grasp what he wanted. You guessed what I was thinking, Gratch. I would go to her myself to protect her. But that would take too much time, and she might be in danger right now. You're big, but you're not big enough to carry me. The only thing we can do is to have you go to her and protect her. Gratch nodded his willingness with a grin that bared his fangs. He seemed to suddenly realize what that meant and threw his arms around Richard. Gratch, log, rutch, harg. Richard patted the guard's back. I love you too, Gratch. He had sent Gratch away once before in order to save the guard's life, but Gratch hadn't understood. He had told Gratch he would never do that again. He hugged the guard tight before pushing back. Gratch, listen to me. The glowing green eyes were watering up. Gratch, Kalen loves you, as I do. She wants you to be with us the same as I do, the same way you want me to be with you. I want all of us to be together. I'm going to wait here, and I want you to go protect her and bring her back. He smiled and stroked Gratch's shoulder. Then we'll all be together. Gratch's prominent eyebrows drew into a dubious frown. Then, when we're all together, you won't have just one friend, but you'll have both of us. And my grandfather Zed, too. He'll love having you around. You'll like him, too. Gratch was looking a bit more enthusiastic. You'll have lots of friends to wrestle with you. Before the gar could pounce on him, Richard held him at arm's length. There was little in life that Gratch loved as much as wrestling. Gratch, I can't have fun wrestling with you now when I'm worried about the people I love. You understand, don't you? Would you want to have fun wrestling with someone else if I were in danger and needed you? Gratch considered it a moment and then shook his head. Richard hugged him again. When they parted, 
Gratch spread his wings with a spirited flap. Gratch, can you fly in the snow? Gratch nodded. At night? The guard nodded again, showing fangs behind his smile. All right, now you listen to me, so you'll be able to find her. I taught you directions, north and south and like that. You know directions. Good. Kalen is to the southwest. Richard pointed southwest, but Gratch beat him to it. Richard laughed. Good. She's to the southwest. She's going away from us, on her way to a city. She thought I was going to catch up with her and go to the city with her, but I can't. I must wait here. She has to come back here. She's with other people. There's an old man with white hair with her. He's my friend, my grandfather Zed. There are other people with her too, many of them soldiers. A lot of people. Do you understand? Gratch gave a sad frown. Richard rubbed his forehead, trying to think through his weariness for a way to explain it. Like tonight, Kara said from across the balcony. Like when you were talking to all the people tonight. Yes, like that, Gratch. He pointed at the main floor, circling his finger around. All the people in here tonight when I was talking to them, about that many people will be with her. Gratch at last grunted that he understood. Richard patted his friend's chest in relief. He held out the letter. You have to take her this letter so that she'll understand why she has to come back here. It explains everything to her. It's very important that she gets this letter. Do you understand? Gratch snatched up the letter in a claw. Richard raked back his hair. No, that won't do. You can't carry it like that. You may need your claws or you may drop it and lose it. Besides, it'll get all wet in the snow and she won't be able to read it. His voice trailed off as he tried to think of a way for Gratch to carry the letter. Lord Rall. He turned and Raina tossed him something through the dim light. When he caught it, he realized it was the leather pouch that had carried General Trimac's letter all the way from the People's Palace in Dahara. Richard grinned. Thanks, Raina. Smirking, she shook her head. Richard put his letter, his hopes, everyone's hopes, in the leather pouch and hung its thong around Gratch's neck. Gratch gurgled with pleasure at the new addition to his collection before again studying the lock of Kalin's hair. Gratch, it's possible that for some reason she may not be with all those people. I have no way of telling what may happen between now and when you reach her. It may be hard to find her. He watched Gratch stroking the lock of hair. Richard had seen Gratch catch a fluttermouse in midair on a moonless night. He would be able to find people on the ground, but he still had to have a way to know which people were the right ones. Gratch, you haven't ever seen her before, but she has long hair like this. Not many women do, and I told her all about you. She won't be afraid when she sees you, and she'll call you by name. That's how you can know it's really her. She'll know your name. Satisfied at last with all his instructions, Gratch flapped his wings and bounced on the balls of his feet, eager to be off so he could bring Kalen back to Richard. Richard swung the window open. The snow howled in. One last time, the two friends hugged. She's been running away from here for two weeks and will continue on until you reach her. It may take you a while to catch her, many days, so don't get discouraged. And be careful, Gratch, I don't want you to get hurt. I want you back here with me so I can wrestle with you, you big furry beast. Gratch giggled a fearsome yet happy noise, then climbed up on the ledge. Gratch, la Gratch, harg. Richard waved. I love you, Gratch. Be careful. Safe journey. Gratch waved back and then bounded out into the night. Richard stood watching the cold blackness, even though the gar had disappeared almost instantly. Richard felt a sudden hollow emptiness. Though he was surrounded by people, it wasn't the same. They were there only because they were bonded to him and not because they really believed in him or what he was doing. Kalen had been fleeing for two weeks, and it would probably take the gar at least another week, maybe two, to finally catch her. Richard couldn't imagine it taking less than a month or more for Gratch to find Kalen and Zed, and for all of them to return to Aidendrill. It could be closer to two months. He already had a knot in his gut, anxious for his friends to be back with him. They had been parted too long. He wanted this lonesome feeling to end, and only their presence could banish it. After closing the window, he turned back to the room. The two moored Sith were standing right behind him. Gretch really is your friend, Kara said. Richard only nodded, not wanting to test the lump in his throat. Kara glanced at Raina before speaking to him. Lord Rall, we have been discussing this matter and have decided that it would be best if you were in Dahara where you will be safe. 
We can leave an army here to guard your queen when she arrives and escort her back to Dahara to be with you. I've already told you I must remain here. The Imperial Order wants to conquer the world. I'm a wizard and must stand against that. You said you didn't know how to use your gift. You said you knew nothing about how to wield magic. I don't, but my grandfather Zed does. I have to stay here until he arrives. Then he can teach me what I need to know so I can fight the Order and keep them from taking over the world. Kara dismissed the matter with a wave of her hand. Someone always wants to rule those who don't already rule. From the safety of the Hara, you can direct your war against the Order. When the representatives from the palaces return from their homelands to offer their surrender, then the Midlands will be yours. You will rule the world, and without having to be in harm's view. Once the lands surrender, then the Imperial Order will be finished. Richard started for the stairway. You don't understand. There's more to it than that. Somehow the Imperial Order has infiltrated the New World and has gained allies. New World? Kara asked as she and Raina started after him. What is the New World? Westland, where I'm from, the Midlands, and the Hara make up the New World. They make up all the world, Kara said with finality. Spoken like a fish in a pond, Richard said, sliding his hand lightly down the silken, smooth railing as he descended the stairs. You think that's all there is to the world? Just the pond you see? That it all just ends at an ocean or mountain range or desert or something? Only the spirits know. Kara stopped at the bottom of the steps and cocked her head. What do you think? That there are other lands beyond these? Other ponds? She swept her Aegeal around in a circle. Out there somewhere? Richard threw his hands up. I don't know, but I do know that to the south is the old world. Raina folded her arms. To the south is a barren waste. Richard started across the expansive floor. Embedded in the wasteland was a place called the Valley of the Lost, and running through it from ocean to ocean, a barrier called the Towers of Perdition. The towers were set in place 3,000 years ago by wizards with unimaginable power. The spells of those towers have prevented almost anyone from crossing for the last 3,000 years, and so the old world beyond was forgotten in time. Kara flashed a skeptical frown as their boot strikes echoed around the dome. How do you know this? I was there in the old world, at the Palace of the Prophets, in a great city called Tanimura. Truly? Raina asked. Richard nodded. She added a frown to Kara's. And if no one can get through, then how did you? It's a long story. But basically these women, the Sisters of the Light, took me there. We could cross because we have the gift, but not strong enough to draw the destructive power of the spells. No one else could get through, and so the old and new worlds remained separated by the towers and their spells. Now the barrier between the old and new world has fallen. No one is safe. The Imperial Order is from the old world. It's a long way, but they will come, and we must be prepared. Kara eyed him suspiciously. And if this barrier has been in place for 3,000 years, how did this come to happen now? Richard cleared his throat as they followed him up onto the dais. Well, I guess it's my fault. I destroyed the tower's spells. They no longer stand as a barrier. The wasteland has been restored to the green meadowland it once was. The two women appraised him silently. Kara leaned past him to speak to Raina. And he says he doesn't know how to use magic. Raina shifted her gaze to Richard. So what you are saying is that you have caused this war. You made it possible. No. Look, it's a long story. Richard raked back his hair. Even before the barrier was down, they were gaining allies here and had started their war. Ebenicia was destroyed before the barrier came down. But now there's nothing to hold them back or slow them down. Don't underestimate them. They use wizards and sorceresses. They wish to destroy all magic. They wish to destroy all magic, yet they use magic themselves? Lord Raal, that makes no sense, Kara scoffed. You want me to be the magic against magic? Why? He pointed to the men on either end of the dais. Because they can only be the steel against steel. It often takes magic to destroy magic. Richard gestured, his finger including the two women. You have magic. And to what purpose? To counter magic. As Mord Sith, you are able to appropriate the magic of another and turn it against them. It's the same with them. They use magic to help them destroy magic, just as Dark and Rahl used you to torture and kill those with magic who opposed him. 
You have magic. The Order will want to destroy you. I have magic. They'll want to destroy me. All Daharans have magic through the bond. Eventually, the Order will see that and decide to exterminate the taint. Sooner or later, they'll come to crush Dahara just as they would crush the Midlands. The Daharan troops will crush them instead, Ulick said over his shoulder, as if stating with confidence that the sun would set this day as it always did. Richard shot a glare at the man's back. Until I came along, Daharans joined with them and in their name annihilated Ebenissia. The Daharans here in Aidendril followed the commands of the Imperial Order. His four guards fell silent. Kara stared at the ground before her feet as Raina let out a disheartened sigh. In the confusion of the war, Kara said at last, as if thinking aloud, some of our troops out in the field would have felt the bond break, just as some of those at the palace did when you killed Dark and Ral. They would be like lost souls without a new Master Ral to take up their bond. They may have simply joined with someone who would give them direction, take up the place of the bond. Now they have their bond back. We have a master all. Richard slumped down in the mother confessor's chair. That's what I'm hoping. All the more reason to return to the Hara, Raina said. We must protect you so you can continue to be the master all and our people will not join with the imperial order. If you are killed and the bond is broken, then the army will once again turn to the order for direction. Better to leave the Midlands to their own battles. It is not your job to save them from themselves. Everyone in the Midlands, then, will fall under the sword of the Imperial Order, Richard said in a soft voice. They will be treated as you were treated by Dark and Rahl. No one will ever again be free. We can't let that happen as long as there's any chance we can stop them. It must be done now, before they gain any more of a foothold here in the Midlands. Kara rolled her eyes. The spirits save us from a man with a just cause. It is not up to you to lead them. If I don't, then in the end, everyone will live under one rule, the orders, Richard said. All people will be their chattel for all time. Tyrants don't tire of tyranny. The room rang with silence. Richard thumped his head against the chair back. He was so tired, he didn't think he could keep his eyes open much longer. He didn't know why he was bothering to try to convince them. They didn't seem to understand or care about what it was he was trying to do. Kara leaned against the desk and wiped a hand across her face. We don't want to lose you, Lord Rahl. We don't want to go back to the way things were. She sounded on the verge of tears. We like being able to do simple things, like make a joke and laugh. We could never do such things before. We always lived in fear that if we said the wrong thing, we would be beaten or worse. Now that we have seen another way, we don't want to go back to that. If you throw your life away for the Midlands, then we will. Kara, all of you, listen to me. If I don't do this, then in the end, that's what will happen. Can't you see that? If I don't unite the lands under a strong rule, under a just law and leadership, then the order will take everything, one chunk at a time. If the Midlands fall under their shadow, then that shadow will steal across Dahara too, and in the end, all the world will fall into darkness. I don't do this because I want to, but because I can see that I have a chance to accomplish the task. If I don't try, there will be no place for me to hide. They will find me and kill me. I don't want to conquer and rule people. I just want to live a quiet life. I want to have a family and live in peace. That's why I must show the lands of the Midlands that we are strong and will sanction no favoritism or bickering, that we're not going to be lands in an alliance, standing as one only when it's expedient, but that we truly are one. They must be confident that we will stand for what's right so that they'll feel secure joining us, so they will know that there's a place for them with us, and so that they'll be heartened by knowing that they will not have to fight alone if they wish to fight for freedom. We must be a powerful force they will trust in, trust in enough to join. The room fell into an icy silence. Richard closed his eyes as he laid his head back against the chair. They thought him mad. It was no use. He was simply going to have to order them to do the things he needed and stop worrying about if they liked it or not, much less cared. Kara finally spoke. Lord Rahl. He opened his eyes to see her standing with her arms folded and a grim expression on her face. I will not change your child's swaddling clothes, nor bathe it, nor burp it, nor make foolish sounds to it. Richard closed his eyes and laid his head back against the chair again as he chuckled to himself. He remembered the time when he was back home before all this started and the midwife had come in a lather for Zed. 
Elaine Seaton, a young woman not a whole lot older than Richard, was having her first child, and it was not going well. The midwife had spoken in hushed tones as she turned her broad back to Richard and leaned toward Zed. Before Richard knew Zed was his grandfather, he only knew him as his best friend. At the time, Richard hadn't known Zed was a wizard, nor did anyone else. Everyone simply knew him as Old Zed, the Cloud Reader, a man of considerable knowledge about the most ordinary and the most peculiar of things, about rare herbs and human ailments, about healing and where rain clouds had traveled from, about where to dig a well and when to start digging a grave. And he knew about childbirth. Richard knew Elaine. She taught him to dance so that he might ask a girl at the Midsummer Festival for a turn. Richard had wanted to learn until faced with the prospect of actually holding a woman in his arms. He was afraid he might break her or something, he wasn't sure what, but everyone always told him he was strong and had to take care not to hurt people. When he changed his mind and tried to beg off, Elaine laughed and swept him up in her arms and started twirling him about while humming a merry tune. Richard didn't know much about the business of birthing babies, but from what he had heard, he had no desire to go anywhere near Elaine's house while it was going on. He headed for the door, intending on a walk in the opposite direction from trouble. Zed snatched up his bag of herbs and potions, grabbed Richard's sleeve and said, Come with me, my boy. I may need you. Richard insisted he could be of no help, but when Zed had his mind set on something, he could make stones seem malleable by comparison. As Zed shoved him out the door, he said, You never know, Richard. You might even learn something. Elaine's husband, Henry, was off with the crew cutting ice for the inns, and because of the weather, hadn't returned yet from his deliveries to nearby towns. There were several women in the house, but they were all in with Elaine. Zed told Richard to make himself busy tending the fire and heating some water, and that he was likely to be a while. Richard sat in the cold kitchen, sweat running down his scalp while he listened to the most horrifying screams he had ever heard. There were muffled words of comfort from the midwife and the other women, but mostly there were the screams. He stoked the fire, melting snow in a big kettle to give himself an excuse to go outside. He told himself that Elaine and Henry might need more wood, what with a new baby and all, so he cut and chopped a good-sized pile. It did no good. He could still hear Elaine's screams. It wasn't the way they put voice to pain, but the way they were seared with panic that made Richard's heart hammer. Richard knew Elaine was going to die. A midwife wouldn't have come for Zed unless there was serious trouble. Richard had never seen a dead person. He didn't want the first to be Elaine. He remembered her laughter when she had taught him to dance. His face had been red the whole time, but she pretended not to notice. And then, while he sat at the table, staring off, thinking the world was a very terrible place indeed, there was a last scream, more agonizing than the rest. That sent a shiver down his spine. It died out in forlorn misery. He squeezed his eyes shut in the dragging silence, damming in the tears. Digging a grave in the frozen ground was going to be near to impossible, but he promised himself that he would do it for Elaine. He didn't want them to keep her frozen body in the undertaker's shed until spring. He was strong. He would do it if it took him a month. She had taught him to dance. The door to the bedroom squeaked open, and Zed shuffled out carrying something. Richard, come here. He handed over a gory mess with tiny arms and legs. Wash him gently. What? How do I do that? Richard stammered. In warm water, Zed bellowed. Bags, my boy, you did heat water, didn't you? Richard pointed with his chin. Not too hot now, just lukewarm. Then swaddle him in those blankets and bring him back into the bedroom. But Zed, the women, they should do it, not me. Dear spirits, can't the women do it? Zed, his white hair in disarray, peered at him with one eye. If I wanted the women to do it, my boy, I wouldn't have asked you, now would I? In a flurry of robes, he was off. The door to the bedroom banged closed. Richard was afraid to move for fear he would crush the little thing. It was so tiny he could hardly believe it was real. And then something happened. Richard began to grin. This was a person, a spirit new to the world. He was beholding magic. When he took the bathed and blanketed Marvel into the bedroom, he was moved to tears to see that Elaine was very much alive. His trembling legs were hardly able to hold him. Elaine, you sure can dance, was the only thing he could think to say. How did you manage to do such a wondrous thing? The women around the bed stared at him as if he were daft. Elaine smiled through her exhaustion. Someday, you can teach Bradley to dance, bright eyes. She held her hands out. 
Her grin grew as Richard gently put her child into her arms. Well, my boy, seems you figured it out after all. Zed lifted an eyebrow. Learn anything? Bradley must be ten by now, and called him Uncle Richard. As he listened to the quiet, returning from the memories, Richard thought about what Kara had said. Yes, you will, he told her at last, in a gentle tone. Even if I have to command it, you will. I want you to feel the wonder of a new life, a new spirit in your arms, so that you can feel magic other than that Aegeal at your wrist. You will bathe him and swaddle him and burp him, so that you will know your tender care is needed in this world, and that I would trust my own child in that care. You will make foolish sounds to him so that you can laugh with joy at the hope for the future and perhaps forget that you have killed people in the past. If you can understand none of the rest, I hope you can understand at least this much of my reasons for what I must do. He relaxed back in the chair, letting his muscles slacken for the first time in hours. The hush seemed to hum around him. He thought about Kalin and let his mind drift. Kara whispered through tight lips and tears, a soft sound almost lost in the huge room and its tomb-like silence. If you get yourself killed trying to rule the world, I will personally break every bone in your body. Richard felt his cheeks tighten with a smile. The darkness behind his eyelids swirled with dark plumes of color. He was acutely aware of the chair around him, the mother confessor's chair, Kalin's chair. From it she had ruled the Midlands Alliance, he could feel the eyes of the first Mother Confessor and her wizard glaring down at him as he sat in the hallowed place after having demanded the surrender of the Midlands and the end of an alliance that they had forged to be the foundation for an everlasting peace. He had come into this war fighting for the cause of the Midlands. He now commanded his former enemy and had placed his sword at the throats of his allies. In one day, he had turned the world upside down. Richard knew he was breaking the alliance for the right reasons, but he agonized about what Kaylin was going to think. She loved him and would understand, he told himself. She had to. Dear spirits, what was Zed going to think? His arms rested heavily where Kaylin's had. He imagined her arms around him now, as they had been the night before in that place between worlds. He didn't think he had ever been that happy in his whole life or felt so loved. He thought he could hear someone telling him he should find a bed, but he was already asleep. Chapter 17 Despite returning to find several thousand brutish Daharan troops surrounding his palace, Tobias was in a good mood. Things were turning out splendidly. Not the way he had originally planned that morning, but splendidly nonetheless. The Daharans made no effort to hinder his entrance, but warned him that he had better not come out again that night. Their effrontery was galling, but he was more interested in the old woman Etori was preparing than in the Daharan's lack of protocol. He had questions and was impatient for the answers. She would be ready to give them by now. Etori was well practiced at his craft. Even though this was the first time he had been trusted to handle the preparations for a questioning without a more experienced brother overseeing his hand, that hand had already proven to be talented and steady at the task. Etori was more than ready for the responsibility. Tobias shook the snow from his cape onto the ruby and gold carpet, not bothering to clean his boots before he marched across the spotless anteroom toward the corridors leading to the stairs. The wide halls were lit by cut glass lamps hung before polished silver reflectors that sent wavering rays of light dancing over the gilt woodwork. Crimson caped guards patrolling the palace touched fingertips to their foreheads as they bowed. Tobias didn't trouble himself with returning the salutes. With Galtero and Lunetta right behind, he took the steps two at a time. While the walls on the main level were trimmed with ornate paneling adorned with portraits of Nicobarese royalty and decorated tapestries depicting their fabled, largely fictitious exploits, the walls on the lower level were simple stone block, cold to the eye as well as the touch. The room he headed for, though, would be warm. As he knuckled his mustache, he winced at the ache in his bones, the cold seemed to make his joints ache more of late. He admonished himself to be more concerned with the Creator's work and less with such mundane matters. The Creator had blessed him with more than a good amount of help this night. It must not be wasted. On the upper levels, the halls had been well guarded by the men of the Fist, but downstairs the drab corridors were empty. There was no way into or out of the palace from the lower levels. Galtero, ever watchful, eyed the length of the hall outside the door to the questioning room. 
Lunetta waited patiently with a smile. Tobias had told her she had done well, especially with the last spell, and she was a glowing reflection of his good graces. Tobias stepped into the room and came face to face with Etore's familiar wide grin. The eyes, however, were filmed with death. Tobias froze. Etori was hanging by a cord tied to either end of an iron pin driven through his ears. His feet dangled just clear of a dark coagulated puddle. There was a neat slice from a razor all the way around the middle of his neck. Below that, every inch of him had been skinned. Pale strips of it lay to the side in an oozing heap. An incision just below the rib cage gaped open. On the floor in front of his gently swinging body lay his liver. It had a few bites out of each side. The bites on one side were edged with irregular tears left by larger teeth. On the other were those of small orderly teeth. Brogan spun with a wail of rage and backhanded Lunetta with his fist. She crashed to the wall beside the fireplace and slid to the floor. This be your fault, Streganicha. This be your fault. You should have stayed here and attended, Etori. Brogan stood, fists at his side, glaring at the skinned body of one of his blood of the fold. If Etori wasn't dead, Brogan would have killed him himself, with his bare hands, if need be, for letting that old hag escape justice. To let a baneling escape was inexcusable. A true baneling hunter would kill the evil one before he died, no matter what it took. Etori's mocking grin incensed him. Brogan struck the cold face. You have failed us, Itori. You are discharged with dishonor from the fold. Your name will be expunged from the roster. Lunetta cowered against the wall, holding her bloody cheek. I told you that I should stay and attend him. I told you. Brogan glowered down at her. Don't give me your filthy excuses, Straganicha. If you knew how much trouble the old hag was going to be, then you should have stayed. But I told you I should. She wiped ears from her eyes. You made me come with you. He ignored her and turned to his colonel. Get the horses, he hissed through gritted teeth. He should kill her right now. He should slit her throat and be done with it. He was sick of her vile taint. This night it had cost him valuable information. The old woman, he was now sure, would have been a trove of information. If not for his loathsome sister, he would have had it. How many horses, Lord General? Galtero whispered. Brogan watched his sister staggering to her feet, regaining her composure as she cleaned blood from her cheek. He should kill her this very moment. Three, Brogan growled. Galtero extracted a cudgel from the interrogation tools before he glided through the door, silent as a shadow, and vanished down the hall. The guards obviously hadn't seen her, although with banelings that didn't necessarily mean anything. But it was always possible the old woman could still be around. Galtero didn't need to be told that if she were found, she was to be taken alive. Impetuous vengeance with a sword would gain no benefit. If she were found, she would be taken alive and questioned. If she were found, she would pay the price of her profanity. But she would tell all she knew first. If she were found. He looked to his sister. Do you sense her anywhere near? Lunetta shook her head. She wasn't scratching her arms. Even if there weren't a couple thousand Daharan troops around the palace with the storm raging as it was, it would be impossible to track anyone. Besides, as much as he wanted the old woman, Brogan had a quarry of greater profanity to go after. And then there was the matter of Lord Rahl. If Galtero found the old woman, fine, but if not, they couldn't spare the time for a difficult and most likely fruitless hunt. Banelings were hardly a rarity. There would always be another. The Lord General of the Blood of the Fold had more important work to see to, the Creator's work. Lunetta hobbled to Brogan's side and slipped an arm around his waist. She stroked his heaving chest. It be late, Tobias, she cooed intimately. Come to bed. You have had a hard day doing the Creator's work. Let Lunetta make you feel better. You will be pleased, I promise. He said nothing. Galtero had his pleasure. Let Lunetta give you yours. I will do a glamour for you she offered. Please, Tobias. He considered it only a moment. There be no time. We must leave at once. I hope you have learned a lesson this night, Lunetta. I won't tolerate your misbehaving again. Her head bobbed. Yes, my Lord General. I will try to do better. I will do better. You will see. He led her up out of the lower levels to the room where he had talked to the witnesses. Guards stood before the door. Inside, from the long table, 
He picked up his trophy case and strapped it to his belt. He started for the door, but turned back. The silver coin he had left on the table, the one the old woman had given him, was gone. He looked to a guard. I don't suppose anyone came in here tonight after I left. No, Lord General, the stiff guard replied. Not a soul. Brogan grunted to himself. She had been here. She had taken back her coin so as to leave him a message. On his way out, he didn't bother to question any of the other guards. They, too, would have seen nothing. The old woman and her little familiar were gone. He put them from his mind and focused on the things that needed doing. Brogan wound his way through the corridors to the rear of the palace, where it was a short crossing of open ground to the stables. Galtero would know to gather the things they needed for a journey, and would have three of the strongest horses saddled. There were sure to be Daharans all around the palace, but with the darkness and wind-driven snow, he was sure it would be possible for him and Lunetta to make it to the stables. Brogan said nothing to the men. If he was to go after the mother confessor, it could only be the three of them. With the storm, three might be able to slip away, but the whole fist would not. That many men would surely be seen and confronted. There would be a battle, and they would probably all be killed. The blood of the fold were fierce fighters, but they were no match for the Daharan's numbers. Worse, from what he had seen, the Daharans were no strangers to battle. Better to simply leave the men here as a diversion. They couldn't betray what they didn't know. Brogan cracked open the thick oak door and peered out into the night. He saw only swirling snow lit by the dim light coming from a few of the second floor rear windows. He would have extinguished the lamps, but he needed the little light they provided in order to find the unfamiliar stables in the storm. Stay close to me. If we're confronted by soldiers, they will try to prevent us from leaving. We can't allow that. We must be off after the mother confessor. But Lord Genera... Be quiet, Brogan snapped. If they try to stop us, you had better get us through, understand? If there be many, I can only... Don't test me, Lunetta. You said you would do better. I'm giving you that chance. Don't fail me again. She pulled her pretties close. Yes, Lord General. Brogan blew out the lamp just inside the hall and then pulled Lunetta through the doorway out into the blizzard, wading with her into the drifts. Galtero would have the horses saddled by now. They had only to make it to the horses. In this snow, the Daharans wouldn't have time to see them coming or to stop them once they were on horseback. The dark rise of the stable buildings drew closer. Out of the snow, shapes began appearing. Soldiers. When they saw him, they called out to their fellows and at the same time drew steel. Their voices didn't carry far in the howling wind, but they carried enough to collect a swarm of big men. They were all around. Lunetta, do something. She cocked an arm with fingers clawed as she began summoning a spell, but the men didn't hesitate. They ran forward with weapons raised. He flinched as an arrow zipped past his cheek. The creator had provided a gust of wind that carried the shaft wide, sparing him. Lunetta ducked as arrows ripped past. Seeing men rushing toward him from all directions, Tobias drew his sword. He thought to make it back to the palace, but that way too was blocked. There were too many. Lunetta was so busy trying to ward off the arrows that she couldn't call a spell to protect them. She squealed in fright. Just as suddenly as the arrows had started, they stopped. Tobias heard screams carried on the wind. He snatched Lunetta's arm and sprang through the deep drifts, hoping to make the stables. Galtero would be there. Several men moved to block him. The one closest cried out as a shadow passed in front of him. The man tumbled face first into the snow. Tobias watched in confusion as the other men began swinging swords at the gusts of wind. The wind cut them down without mercy. Tobias stumbled to a halt, blinking at what he was seeing. The Harans all around him were dropping. Shrieks lifted on the howling wind. He saw snow stained red. He saw men fall in their tracks, spilling their guts. Tobias licked his lips, afraid to move lest the wind take him too. His gaze darted in every direction as he tried to make sense of what was happening, tried to see the attackers. Dear Creator, he called out, spare me, I do your work. Men were converging on the stable yard from every direction, and they were being brought down as fast as they came. Well over a hundred corpses already littered the snowy field. He had never seen men slain with such speed or brutality. Tobias crouched down and was startled to realize that the twirling gusts were moving deliberately. They were alive. He began to make them out. White-caped men slipped all around him, attacking the Daharan soldiers with swift and deadly grace. Not one of the Daharans tried to flee. They all came on fiercely, but none managed to engage the enemy before they were quickly dispatched. Page 151.
The night fell silent, but for the wind. Before there was time to run, it was over. The ground was cluttered with a jumble of still, dark shapes. Tobias turned all about, but saw none left alive. Already the snow was beginning to drift over the bodies. In another hour, they would vanish under the white fury. The caped men skimmed fluidly through the snow, graceful and slithery, moving as if they were made of wind. As they came toward him, his sword slipped from his numb fingers. Tobias wanted to call out to Lunetta to strike them down with a spell, but as they came into the light, his voice failed him. They were not men. Scales, the color of the snowy night, undulated over rippling muscles. Smooth skin sheathed earless, hairless, blunt heads set with beady eyes. The beasts wore only simple hide clothes beneath capes that billowed and flapped in the wind, and in each clawed hand they gripped blood-slicked three-bladed knives. They were the creatures he had seen impaled on the poles outside the confessor's palace, the creatures Lord Rahl had killed, Mriswith. Having seen them slaughter all these experienced soldiers, Tobias couldn't imagine how Lord Rahl or anyone could have bested one, much less the number he had seen. One of the creatures skulked toward him, watching with unblinking eyes. It glided to a stop not ten feet away. Leave, the Mriswith hissed. What? Tobias stammered. Leave. It slashed the air with its claw-like knife, a quick gesture, graceful with murderous mastery. Escape. Why? Why would you do this? Why do you want us to escape? The lipless mouth slit widened, mimicking a gruesome grin. The dream swalker wants you to escape. Go now before more skin walkers come. Go. But with a scaled arm, the mris withdrew its cape against the wind, turned and vanished into the blowing snow. Tobias peered into the night, but the wind had gone vacant and lifeless. Why would such vile creatures want to help him? Why would they kill his enemies? Why would they want him to escape? Comprehension came over him in a loving, warm rush. The Creator had sent them. Of course! How could he have been so blind? Lord Rahl had said he killed the Mriswith. Lord Rahl fought for the Keeper. If the Mriswith were evil creatures, Lord Rahl would fight on their side, not against them. The Mriswith had said the Dreamwalker sent them. The Creator came to Tobias in his dreams. That had to be it. The Creator had sent them. Lunetta. Tobias turned to her. She was cowering behind him. The Creator comes to me in my dreams. That was what they were trying to tell me when they said the one from my dreams had sent them. Lunetta, the Creator sent them to help protect me. Lunetta's eyes widened. The Creator himself has intervened on your behalf to thwart the Keeper's plans. The Creator himself watches over you. He must have great things planned for you, Tobias. Tobias retrieved his sword from under the snow and straightened with a smile. Indeed, I have kept his wishes above all else, and so he has protected me. Hurry, we must do as his messengers have told us. We must be off to do the Creator's work. As he trudged through the snow, winding his way among the bodies, he looked up to see a dark shape suddenly leap before him, blocking his path. Well, well, Lord General, going someplace? A menacing grin came to the face. Do you wish to cast a spell on me, sorceress? Tobias still had his sword in his hand, but he knew he wouldn't be quick enough. He flinched at the sound of a bone-jarring thunk. The one before him pitched face first into the snow at his feet. Tobias looked up to see Galtero standing with the cudgel above the unconscious figure. Galtero, you have earned your rank this night. The creator had just given him a priceless prize, showing him again that nothing was out of the reach of the pious. Thankfully, Galtero had the presence of mind to use the cudgel and not a blade. He saw blood from the blow, but he saw the breath of life, too. My, my, but this is turning out to be quite the good night. Lunetta, you have some work to do on behalf of the Creator before you heal this one. Lunetta bent beside the still form, pressing her fingers into the blood-matted, wavy brown hair. Perhaps I ought to do a healing first. Galtero be stronger than he thinks. That, my dear sister, would not be advisable, at least not from what I have heard. The healing can wait. He glanced to his colonel and gestured to the stables. Are the horses ready? Yes, Lord General, as soon as you are. 
Tobias drew the knife Galtero had given him. We must hurry, Lunetta. The messenger told us we must escape. He squatted down and rolled the unconscious figure over. And then we must be off after the mother confessor. Lunetta leaned close, peering at him. But, Lord General, I told you, the wizard's web hides her identity from us. We cannot see the strands of a web like that. We will not know her. A grin tightened the scar at the side of Tobias Brogan's mouth. Oh, but I have seen the strands of the web. The mother confessor's name be Kaelin Amnell. Chapter 18 As she had feared, she was a prisoner. She flipped another page over after making the appropriate entry in the ledger book. A prisoner of the highest station, a prisoner behind a paper lock, but a prisoner nevertheless. Verna yawned as she scanned the next page, checking the records of palace expenses. Each report required her approval and had to be initialed to show that the prelate herself had certified the expenses. Why it was necessary was a mystery to her, but having only held the office for a few days, she was loath to declare it a waste of her time, only to have Sister Leoma or Dulcinea or Philippa divert their eyes and explain under their breath, so as not to cause the prelate embarrassment, why it was indeed necessary, and go on in great detail to explicate the dire consequences of not doing such a simple thing that would require hardly any effort on her part, but would be of such benefit to others. She could anticipate the reaction should she declare she was not going to bother to check the tallies. Why prelate, if the people didn't fear that the prelate herself was concerned enough to be watching their work orders, they would be emboldened to gouge the palace. The sisters would be thought wasteful fools without an ounce of sense. And then on the other side, if the work orders weren't paid while waiting the prelate's directive, the poor workers' families would go hungry. You wouldn't want those children to go hungry, would you, simply because you didn't want to pay them the courtesy of approving payment for their hard work already done? Just because you don't wish to glance at the report and go to the trouble of initialing it, would you really want them to think the prelate so callous? Verna sighed as she skimmed the report of expenses for the stables. Hay and grain, the farrier, the tack upkeep, replacement of lost tack, repair to the stable after a stallion staved in a stall, and repair needed after several horses apparently panicked in the night, broke down a fence, and bolted off into the countryside. She was going to have to have a talk to the stable personnel and insist they keep better order under their roof. She jammed the pen in the ink bottle, sighed again, and initialed the bottom of the page. As she turned the stable tallies over on top of the pile of other tallies she had already perused, initialed, and entered in the ledger, someone knocked softly at the door. She pulled another paper from the stack of reports yet to be worked, a lengthy reckoning from the butcher, and started scanning down the figures. She had had no idea how expensive it was to run the Palace of the Prophets. The soft knock came again. Probably Sister Dulcinea or Phoebe wanting to bring in another stack of reports. She was not initialing as fast as they could bring them in. How did Prelate Annalina manage to get it all done? Verna hoped it wasn't Sister Leoma, come again to bring to her attention news of some calamity the prelate had caused by an unthinking action or comment. Maybe they would think her too busy and go away if she didn't answer. Along with her old friend, Phoebe, Verna had named Sister Dulcinea to be one of her administrators. It only made sense to have a sister of Dulcinea's experience at hand. It also allowed Verna to keep an eye on the woman. Dulcinea herself had requested the job, citing her knowledge of palace business. Having Sister Leoma and Philippa as trusted advisors was at least useful in keeping them in sight, too. She didn't trust them. For that matter, she didn't trust any of them. She couldn't afford to. Verna had to admit, though, that they had proven themselves willing advisors who always scrupulously kept the best interest of the prelate and the palace uppermost in their advice. It vexed her that she could find no fault in their counsel. The knock came again, polite but insistent. Yes, what is it? The thick door opened enough to admit Warren's head of curly blonde hair. He grinned when he saw the scowl on her face. Verna could see Dulcinea craning her neck to see past him, checking the prelate's progress on the stacks of paper. Warren let himself the rest of the way in. He peered about in the somber room, scrutinizing the work done on it. After the losing battle her predecessor had had with the Sisters of the Dark, the office had been left in ruins. A crew of workmen had hurriedly repaired it, putting it back to order as quickly as possible so that the new prelate wouldn't be inconvenienced for long. Verna knew the cost. She had seen the expense tally. Warren strolled up to the opposite side of the heavy walnut table. Good evening, Verna. You look to be hard at work. 
Important palace business, I presume, to be up this late? Her lips pressed into a thin line. Before she was able to launch into a tirade, Dulcinea took the opportunity, before closing the door behind the visitor, to poke her head in. I've just finished ordering the day's reports, Prelate. Would you like to have them now? You must be near to finished with the others. Verna flashed a villainous grin as she crooked her finger at her aid. Sister Dulcinea flinched at the smirk. Her penetrating blue eyes swept the room, lingering on Warren, before she entered, brushing back her gray hair in a submissive gesture. May I be of assistance, Prelate? Verna folded her hands on the table. Why, yes, sister, you may. Your experience would be valuable in this matter. Verna lifted a report off the pile. I would like you to immediately go on a mission to the stables. It seems we have trouble there and a bit of a mystery. Sister Dulcinea brightened. Trouble, Prelate? Yes. It would seem there are some horses missing. Sister Dulcinea leaned forward a bit, lowering her voice in that tolerant manner of hers. If I remember the report you speak of, Prelate, the horses were frightened by something in the night and bolted. They've simply not turned up yet, that's all. I know that, sister. I would like Master Finch to explain how it is that horses that broke down his fence were able to run off and not be found. Prelate? Verna lifted her eyebrows in mock wonder. We live on an island, do we not? How is it that the horses are no longer on the island? No guard saw them gallop across a bridge. At least I've seen no report of it. This time of year, the fishermen are out on the river day and night, eeling, yet none saw any horses swimming to the mainland. So where are they? Well, I'm sure they simply bolted, Prelate. Perhaps, Verna smiled indulgently, perhaps Master Finch sold them and just said they ran off in order to cover their loss. Sister Dulcinea straightened. Surely, Prelate, you would not want to accuse... Verna slapped a hand to the table and shot to her feet. Tack is also missing. Did the tack also bolt in the night? Or did the horses decide to put it on themselves and go for a jaunt? Sister Dulcinea blanched. I, well, I, I'll i see. You go down to the stables right now and tell Master Finch that if he doesn't find the palace's horses by the time I decide to inquire of the matter again, their cost will come out of his pay and the tack out of his hide. Sister Dulcinea bobbed a quick bow and scurried from the room. When the door banged closed, Warren chuckled. Seems you're falling right into the job, Verna. Don't you start with me, Warren. The grin left his face. Verna, calm down. It's just a couple of horses. The man will find them. It's not worth you getting yourself in a state of tears over. Verna blinked at him. She touched her fingers to her cheek and felt that they were indeed wet. She let out a tired groan and flopped down in her chair. I'm sorry, Warren. I don't know what's come over me. I guess I'm just tired and frustrated. Verna, I've never seen you like this, letting a matter like some silly pieces of paper get you so worked up. Warren, look at this. She snatched up the report. I'm a prisoner in here approving the cost of hauling away manure. Do you have any idea how much manure those horses produce? Or how much food they eat just to make all that manure? Well, no, I guess I would have to admit that she pulled the next report off the stack. Butter. Butter? Yes, butter. Verna scanned the report. Seems it went rancid and we had to buy ten peck to replace it. I'm to consider this and determine if the dairyman has asked a fair price and is to be retained in the future. It must be important to have these matters checked. Verna picked up the next paper. Masons. Masons to fix the roof over the dining hall that leaks. And slate. A lightning bolt broke the slate, they say, and near to a square had to be torn off and replaced. Took ten men two weeks, it says here. I'm to decide if that was timely and approve payment. Well, if people do work, they've a right to be paid, haven't they? She rubbed a finger on the gold sunburst patterned ring. I thought that if I ever had the power, there would be changes in the way the sisters do the creator's work. But this is all I do, Warren. Look at reports. I've been in here day and night reading the most mundane of things until my eyes glaze over. It must be important, Verna. Important? She selected another report with exaggerated reverence. Let's see. Seems two of our young men got drunk and set fire to an inn. The fire was put out. The inn sustained quite a bit of damage. They would like the palace to reimburse them. She set the report aside. I'm going to have a long, loud talk with those two. Seems the right decision, Verna. She selected another report. And what have we here? A seamstress accounting. Dressmaking for the novices. Verna picked up another. Salt, three kinds, but Verna, she plucked another. And this one? 
She waved the paper with mock solemnity. Grave digging. What? Two grave diggers. They want to be paid for their work. She scanned the tally. And I might add that they think highly of their skill by the price they're asking. Look, Verna, I think you've been cooped up in here too long and need a little fresh air. Why don't we go for a walk? A walk? Warren, I don't have time. Prelate, you've been sitting in here too long. You need a little activity. He canted his head while rolling his eyes in an exaggerated gesture toward the door. How about it? Verna glanced toward the door. If Sister Dulcinea did as she was told, then only Sister Phoebe would be in the outer office. Phoebe was her friend. She reminded herself that she could trust no one. Well, yes, I guess I would like a bit of a walk. Warren marched around the desk and lifted her by the arm. Oh, good then. Shall we go? Verna pulled her arm away from his grip and shot him a murderous glare. She gritted her teeth as she spoke in a sing-song voice. Why, yes, why don't we? At the sound of the door, Sister Phoebe hastily stood to bow. Prelate, do you need something? Perhaps a bit of soup, some tea? Phoebe, I've told you a dozen times now that you don't need to bow every time you lay eyes on me. Phoebe bowed again. Yes, Prelate. Her round face flushed red. I mean, I'm sorry, Prelate. Forgive me. Verna gathered her patience with a sigh. Sister Phoebe, we've known each other since we were novices. How many times were we sent to the kitchens together to scrub pots for... Verna glanced to Warren. Well, I can't remember for what. But the point is that we're old friends. Please try to remember that. Phoebe's cheeks plumped with a smile. Of course, Verna. She winced at calling the prelate Verna, even if it was under order. Out in the hall, Warren asked why they were sent to scrub pots. I said I don't remember, she snapped as she glanced back down the empty hall. What's this about? Warren shrugged. Just a walk. He checked the hall himself and then flashed her another meaningful look. I thought that maybe the prelate would like to visit Sister Simona. Verna missed a step. Sister Simona had been in a deranged state for weeks, something about dreams, and had been kept in a shielded room so she couldn't hurt herself or some innocent. Warren leaned close and whispered, I went to visit her earlier. Why? Warren jabbed his finger up and down, pointing at the floor. The vaults. He meant the vaults. She frowned at him. And how was poor Simona? Warren checked the corridor to the right and left when they reached an intersection, then looked behind again. They wouldn't let me see her, he whispered. Outside, the rain roared in a downpour. Verna pulled her shawl over her head and dove into the deluge, dancing over puddles, trying to tiptoe across the stepping stones set in the soggy grass. Yellow light from windows flickered in the pools of standing water. The guards at the gates to the prelate's compound bowed as she and Warren trotted by, making for a covered walkway. Inside, under the low roof, she shook the water from her shawl and draped it across her shoulders as the two of them caught their breath. Warren shook rain from his robes. The walkway's arched sides were protected only by open lattice thick with vines, but the rain wasn't driven by wind, so it was dry enough. She peered into the darkness, but couldn't see anyone. It was quite a ways to the next building, the squat infirmary. Verna slumped down on a stone bench. Warren had been ready to be off, but when she sat, he did too. It was cold, and the heat of him right next to her felt good. The pungent smell of rain and wet dirt was refreshing after being inside for so long. Verna was not used to being inside so much. She liked the out of doors, thought the ground made a fine bed, the trees and fields a fine office, but that part of her life was over now. There was a garden just outside the prelate's office, but she hadn't had time to put her head out to see it. In the distance, the incessant drums thundered on like the heartbeat of doom. I used my Han, he said at last. I don't feel the presence of anyone else near. And you can feel the presence of one with subtractive magic, yes? She whispered. He glanced up in the dark. I never thought of that. What's this about, Warren? Do you think we're alone? How should I know, she snapped. He looked around again and swallowed. Well, I've been doing a lot of reading lately. He pointed again toward the vaults. I just thought we should go see Sister Simona. You already said that. You still haven't told me why. Some of the things I've been reading have been about dreams, he said cryptically. She tried to gaze into his eyes, but she could only see the dark shape of him. Simona has been having dreams? His thigh was pressed against hers. He was shaking with the cold. At least she thought it was the cold. Before she realized what she was doing, she had put her arm around him and pulled his head to her shoulder. Verna, he stammered. I feel so alone. I'm afraid to talk to anyone. I feel like everyone's watching me. 
I'm afraid everyone is going to ask me what I'm studying and why and under whose orders. I've only seen you once in three days, and there's no one else I can talk to. She patted his back. I know, Warren. I've wanted to talk to you too, but I've been so busy. There's so much work to do. Maybe they're giving you work to keep you occupied and out of their hair while they go about business. Verna shook her head in the murk. Maybe. I'm afraid too, Warren. I don't know how to be prelate. I'm afraid I'll bring the Palace of the Prophets to ruin if I don't do the things that need to be done. I'm afraid to say no to Leoma, Philippa, Dulcinea, and Marin. They're trying to advise me in how to be prelate, and if they really are on our side, then their advice is true. If I don't take it, I could be making a big mistake. If the prelate makes a mistake, everyone pays for it. If they aren't on our side, well, the things they ask me to do don't seem as if they could cause any harm. How much ruin can reading reports cause? unless it's to keep you distracted from something important. She stroked his back again before pushing away. I know. I'll try to go for more walks with you. I think the fresh air is doing me good. Warren squeezed her hand. I'm glad, Verna. He stood and straightened his dark robes. Let's go see how Simona is faring. The infirmary was one of the smaller buildings on Hallsband Island. The sisters could heal many common injuries with the aid of their Han, and illnesses beyond the power of their gift usually ended all too quickly in death. So mostly the infirmary housed a few elderly and feeble of the staff who had spent their lives in their work at the Palace of the Prophets and now had no one to care for them. It also was where the insane were confined. The gift was of limited use for sickness of the mind. Near the door, Verna sent her Han into a lamp and carried it with her as they moved through the simple painted corridors toward where Warren said Simona was confined. Only a few of the rooms were occupied, their residents sending snores, wheezes, and coughs echoing through the dim halls. When they reached the end of the corridor that housed the old and feeble, they had to pass through a series of three flimsy doors, each shielded with powerful webs of varied composition. Shields, however, might be broken by those with the gift, even the insane. The fourth door was iron, with a massive bolt protected by an intricate shield designed to deflect attempts to open it from the other side with the use of magic. The more force applied, the tighter the bolt held. It had been set in place by three sisters, and so could not be broken by one on the other side. Two guards came to attention when she and Warren rounded the corner. They bowed their heads, but didn't move away from the door. Warren greeted them pleasantly and motioned with a flit of his hand for them to lift the bolt. Sorry, son, but no one is allowed in. Her fiery eyes fixed on the guard. Verna pushed Warren aside. Is that right, son? He nodded confidently. And who gave those orders? My commander, sister. I don't know who gave the orders to him, but it had to be a sister of some authority. Scowling, she thrust the sunburst ring in front of his face. More authority than this. His eyes widened. No, prelate, of course not. Forgive me, I didn't recognize you. How many are behind this door? The bolt sent a clang echoing down the hall. Just the one sister prelate. Are there any sisters attending her? No, they've gone for the night. Once on the other side and out of earshot, Warren chuckled. I guess you've found some use for that ring at last. Verna slowed to a puzzled stop. Warren, how do you suppose the ring came to be on that pedestal after the funeral? Warren's grin held, but barely. Well, let's see. The grin finally vanished. I don't know. What do you think? She shook her head. It had a light shield around it. Not many can spin such a web. If, as you say, Prelate Annalina trusted no one but me, then who did she trust to put the ring there and spin such a web around it? I can't imagine. Warren hiked his damp robes up on his shoulders. Could she have spun the web herself? Verna lifted an eyebrow. From her funeral pyre? No. I mean, could she have spun it and then had someone else just put it there? You know, like investing a stick with a spell so that someone else can light a lamp with it. I've seen sisters do that so the staff can light the lamps without having to carry around a candle dripping hot wax on their fingers or the floor. Verna raised the lamp higher to look into his eyes. Warren, that's brilliant. He smiled. The smile faded. The question remains, who? She lowered the lamp. Maybe one of the staff she trusted. Someone without the gift, so she wouldn't have to worry about them being... She glanced back up the dark, empty hall. You know what I mean. 
He nodded that he did as she started out. I'll have to look into it. Flashes of light were coming from under the door to Sister Simona's room. Silent little flickers of lightning licking out through the gap under the door. The shield sparkled when the crackles of light managed to reach it, dissipating the power with counterforces, grounding the magic with an opposite. Sister Simona was trying to break the shield. Since Sister Simona was deranged, that was to be expected. The question was, why wasn't it working? Verna recognized the shield around the door as a simple one used to keep young wizards confined when they were being mulish. Verna opened herself to her Han and stepped through the shield. Warren followed as she knocked. The flickers of light coming from under the door cut off. Simona, it's Verna Soventrine. You remember me, don't you, dear? May I come in? No answer came, so Verna turned the knob and eased the door open. She held the lamp out before herself, sending its yellowy glimmers ahead to break the darkness within. The room was empty but for a tray with a pitcher, bread, and fruit, a pallet, a chamber pot, and a filthy little woman cowering in the corner. Leave me be, demon, she shrieked. Simona, it's all right. It's only me, Verna, and my friend Warren. Don't be afraid. Simona blinked in the light, as if it were the sun just risen. Verna set the lamp behind so as not to blind the woman. Simona peered up. Verna? That's right. Simona kissed her ring finger a dozen times, gushing thanks and blessings on the creator. She scurried across the floor on her hands and knees to snatch up the hem of Verna's dress, kissing it too, over and over. Oh, thank you for coming. She scrambled to her feet. Hurry, we must escape. Verna grasped the small woman's shoulders and sat her down on her sleeping pallet. With a gentle hand, she smoothed back the shock of gray hair. Her hand froze. Simona had a collar around her neck. That was why she wasn't able to break the shield. Verna had never seen a sister wearing a Radahan. She had seen hundreds of boys and young men wearing one, but never a sister. The sight of it turned her stomach. She had been taught that in the dim past, Radha Han had been put around the necks of sisters who had lost their minds. Having one with the gift afflicted with insanity was like loosing lightning in a crowded market square. They had to be controlled, but still. Simona, you are safe. You are in the palace under the watchful eye of the Creator. No harm will come to you. Simona broke into tears. I must flee. Please let me go. I must flee. Why must you flee, my dear? The woman wiped tears from the dirt on her face. He comes. Who? The one from my dreams, the dream walker. Who is this dream walker? Simona shrank back. The keeper. Verna paused. This dream walker is the keeper? She nodded so hard Verna thought her neck might come unhinged. Sometimes. Sometimes he's the creator. Warren leaned in. What? Simona flinched. Is it you? Are you the one? I'm Warren, sister. A student, that's all. Simona touched a finger to her cracked lips. You should run too, then. He comes. He wants those with the gift. The one in your dreams? Verna asked. Simona nodded furiously. What does he do in your dreams? Torments me. Hurts me. He... She kissed her ring finger frantically, beseeching the Creator's protection. He tells me I must forsake my oath. He tells me to do things. He's a demon. Sometimes he pretends to be the Creator to trick me, but I know it's him. I know. He's a demon. Verna hugged the frightened woman. It's just a nightmare, Simona. It's not real. Try to see that. Simona almost shook her head right out of its skin. No, it's a dream, but real. He comes. We must run. Verna smiled sympathetically. What makes you think that? Told me he did. He comes. Don't you see, dear? That was just in the dream, not when you're awake. It's not real. The dreams are real. When I'm awake, I know too. You're awake now. Do you know now, dear? Simona nodded. How do you know when you're awake if he isn't there in your head to tell you, like when you dream? I can hear his alert. She looked from Verna's face to Warren's and back again. I'm not crazy, I'm not. Can't you hear the drums? Yes, sister, we hear the drums, Warren smiled. But that's not your dream. It's just the drums announcing the impending arrival of the emperor. Simona touched a finger to her lip again. Emperor? Yes, Warren comforted. The emperor of the old world. He's coming for a visit, that's all. That's what the drums are. 
Her brow creased in worry. Emperor? Yes, Warren said. Emperor Jagang. With a wild shriek, Simona leapt into a corner. She screamed as if she were being stabbed. Her hands flailed. Verna rushed to her, trying to catch her arms and calm her. Simona, you're safe with us. What is it? That's him, she screamed. Jagang, that's the Dreamwalker's name. Let me go. Please let me go before he comes. Simona tore away, careering around the room, sending flashes of lightning flicking everywhere. It raked the paint off the walls like glowing claws. Verna and Warren tried to calm her, tried to catch her, tried to stop her. When Simona could find no way from the room, she began bashing her head against the wall. Simona was a small woman, but she seemed to have the strength of ten men. In the end, and with great reluctance, Verna was forced to use the Radahan to gain control. Warren healed Simona's bleeding forehead after they had quieted her. Verna remembered a spell she had been taught to use on boys newly come to the palace when they were having nightmares from being taken from their parents. A spell to calm fears and let the frightened child sleep a dreamless sleep. Verna clasped the Radha Han between her hands and sent a flow of her Han into Simona. At last her breathing slowed, she went limp, and she slept. Verna hoped it was a dreamless sleep. Shaken, Verna leaned against the door after she closed it on the dark room. Did you find out what you wanted to know? Warren swallowed. I'm afraid so. That wasn't the answer Verna had expected. He didn't offer anything more. Well? Well, I'm not so sure Sister Simona is insane. Not in the conventional sense, anyway. He picked at the braiding on the sleeve of his robe. I'll need to do more reading. It could be nothing. The books are complex. I'll let you know what I find. Verna kissed her finger, but felt the still unfamiliar touch of the prelate's ring under her lips. Dear Creator, she prayed aloud, keep this foolish young man safe for I may snatch his head bald and then strangle him with my bare hands. Warren rolled his eyes. Look, Verna. Prelate, she corrected. Warren sighed and at last nodded. I guess I should tell you, but understand that this is a very old and obscure fork. The prophecies are clogged with false forks. This is doubly tainted because of its age and its rarity. That makes it suspect, even if it weren't for the rest of it. There are crossovers and backfalls galore in tomes this old and I can't verify them without months of work. Some of the links are occluded by triple forks. Back tracing a triple fork squares false forks on the branches, and if any of them are tripled, well then the enigma created by the geometric progressions you encounter because of the... Verna put a hand to his forearm to silence him. Warren, I know all that. I understand the degrees of progression and regression as they relate to random variables in bifurcations of a triple fork. Warren flicked his hand. Yes, of course. I forget what a good student you were. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just rambling. Out with it, Warren. What did Simona say that makes you think she may not be insane in the conventional sense? This Dreamwalker, she mentioned. In two of the oldest books, there are a few references to Dreamwalker. These books are in bad shape, hardly more than dust. But the thing that worries me is that because the books are so old, the mention of Dreamwalker might only seem rare to us because we have only two of the texts, when in fact it might not be rare at all for back then. Most of the books from that time were lost. How old? Over 3,000 years. Verna lifted an eyebrow. From the time of the Great War? Warren confirmed it was so. What about the Dreamwalker? Well, it's hard to understand. When they mention it, it's not so much a person as a weapon. A weapon? What kind of weapon? I don't know. The context is not exactly that of an object either, but more of an entity, though it could be a person. Maybe it's meant in the way that a person who is so good at something like a blade master that they are often described with respect or reverence as a weapon? Warren lifted a finger. That's it. A very good way to describe it, Verna. What do the books say this weapon did with this skill? Warren sighed. I don't know. But I do know that the Dreamwalker had something to do with the Towers of Perdition that finally cut the old and new worlds apart and kept them separated for the last 3,000 years. You mean the Dreamwalkers built the Towers? Warren leaned closer. No, I think the towers were built to stop them. Verna stiffened. Richard destroyed the towers, she said aloud, not intending to. What else? That's all I know so far. Even what I've told you is largely conjecture. We don't know much about books from the time of the war. For all I know, it could simply be tales and not real. Verna rolled her eyes to the door behind her. What I saw in there looked real to me. Warren grimaced. Me too. 
What did you mean about her not being insane in the conventional sense? I don't think Sister Simona is having deranged dreams and imagining things. I think something real happened, and that's what made her the way we see her. The books allude to instances where this blade master of sorts slipped and left the subject unable to separate their dreams from reality, as if their mind can't fully wake from the nightmares or slip from the world around them when they sleep. That sounds like insanity to me, not being able to distinguish what's real from what's not. Warren turned his palm up, a flame ignited just above the flesh. What is reality? I imagined there was a flame and my dream became reality. My wakeful intellect governs what I do. She pulled on a brown curl as she thought out loud. Just as the veil separates the world of the living from the world of the dead, there is a barrier in our minds that separates reality from the imagination, from dreams. Through discipline and our force of will, we control what is reality for us. She looked up suddenly. Dear Creator, that barrier in our minds is what keeps us from using our Han when we sleep. If there were no barrier, then the person would have no intellectual control of their Han while they sleep. Warren nodded. We have control of our Han. When we imagine, it can become real. But the conscious imagination is overlaid with the limitations of the intellect. He leaned toward her, his blue eyes intense. The sleeping imagination has virtually none of these limitations. A dreamwalker can bend reality. Those with the gift can bring it to be. Weapon indeed, she whispered. She took Warren's hand and started down the hall. As frightened as the unknown was, it was a comfort to have at least one friend to help. Her head swirled with a confusion of doubts and questions. She was the prelate now. It was up to her to find some answers before trouble visited the palace. Who died? Warren asked at last. The prelate and Nathan. Verna said absently, because that was where her thoughts were. No, they had the funeral right. I mean, besides them. Verna came back from her mind travels. Besides the prelate and Nathan? No one. No one has died in quite a while. The lamplight danced in his blue eyes. Then why did the palace hire the services of grave diggers? Chapter 19 Richard swung his leg over his horse's flanks, landed on the trampled snow of the stable yard, and tossed the reins to a waiting soldier as the company of 200 soldiers galloped in behind him. He patted his foot-sore horse's neck while a tired Ulick and Egan dismounted right behind. The still, cold, late-day air steamed with drifting clouds of breath of man and horse alike. The silent men were frustrated and discouraged. Richard was angry. He pulled off a thickly padded glove and scratched the four days' growth of beard as he yawned. He was tired, dirty, and hungry, but mostly he was angry. The trackers he had taken with him were good men. General Rybish had told him, and Richard had no cause to dispute the general's word, but as good as they were, they were not good enough. Richard was a keen tracker, too, and several times he had found tell-tales the others had missed, but two days of fierce blizzard made the job impossible and in the end, they had failed. It shouldn't have been necessary in the first place, but he had let himself be duped. His first minor challenge as a leader, and he had botched it. He should never have trusted the man. Why was he always thinking people would see the side of reason and do the right thing? Why did he always think that people had good in them, and if allowed the chance, it would come to the surface? As they slogged through the snow toward the palace, its white walls and spires mellowing to a dusky gray in the evening twilight, he asked Ulick and Egan to go find General Rybish and to inquire about any other disasters that might have transpired while he was gone. The keep watched him from the gloom in the shadows of the mountains, the snow a dark, moody, steel-blue shawl drawn around its granite shoulders. Richard found Mistress Sanderholt busy with her covey of workers in the din of the kitchen and asked if it would be possible for her to find him and his two big guards something to eat, a chunk of dry bread, some leftover soup, anything. She saw that he was in no mood for conversation and offered a silent squeeze of his arm as she told him to put his feet up while she saw to it. He headed for a quiet study not far from the kitchens to sit for a rest while he waited for the others to return. Coming around the corner to the study doorway, Berdine stepped in front of him. She was wearing her red leather. And just where have you been? She asked in an icy, moored Sith tone. Chasing phantoms in the mountains. Didn't Kara and Raina tell you where I was going? You did not tell me. 
Her hard blue eyes didn't budge from his gaze. That is what counts. You will not wander off again without telling me where you are going. Do you understand? Richard felt a chill run through his marrow. There was no mistaking who was speaking. Not Berdine, the woman, but Mistress Berdine, a moored Sith. And it was not a question, it was a threat. Richard gave himself a mental shake. He was just tired, and she had been worried about the Lord Rawl. He was imagining things. What was the matter with him? He had probably given her a fright when she woke to discover he had taken off after Brogan and his sorcerer's sister. She had an odd sense of humor. Maybe this was her idea of a joke. He forced a toothy grin and thought to lighten her concern. Berdine, you know I like you the best. I thought of nothing the whole time but your smiling blue eyes. Richard took a step toward the door. Her aegeal came up in her fist. She planted its tip against the far side of the doorframe, blocking his way. He had never seen Berdine unmask such a sinister countenance. I asked you a question. I expect an answer. Don't make me ask again. This time there was no excusing her tone or her actions. The Aegeal was right in front of his face, and it wasn't there casually. He was seeing for the first time her true Mord Sith persona, the personality her victims had seen, the core character of her vicious indoctrination, and he didn't like it. For an instant he saw through the eyes of those forsaken victims she had had at the end of her Aegeal. No one died an easy death as the captive of a Mord Sith, and none but he had ever survived the ordeal. He suddenly viewed his faith in these women with regret and felt the sting of disappointment in his trust of them. Instead of a chill, it was the heat of anger that surged through his bones this time. He realized he was about to do something he might regret and immediately took control of his temper, but he could feel the rage powering in his glare. Berdine, I had to go after Brogan as soon as I found out he had escaped, if I was to have any chance to find him. I told Kara and Raina where I was going, and at their insistence took Ulick and Egan with me. You were asleep. I saw no need to wake you. Still, she did not move. You were needed here. We have many trackers and soldiers. We have only one leader. The tip of her Aegeal swept around, stopping before his eyes. Don't disappoint me again. It took all his willpower not to reach out and break her arm. She withdrew her Aegeal, along with her blistering glower, and stalked away. Inside the small, darkly paneled room, he hurled his heavy hide mantle at the wall beside the narrow fireplace. How could he be so naive? They were vipers with fangs, and he had allowed them to drape themselves around his neck. He was surrounded by strangers. No, not strangers. He knew what Mord Sith were. He knew some of the things the Daharans had done. He knew some of the things the representatives of some of the lands here had done. Yet he was foolish enough to believe they could do right if given the chance. He leaned a hand on the window frame and stared out on the darkening mountainous landscape as he let the warmth from the low, crackling fire soak in. In the distance, the wizard's keep looked down on him. He missed Gratch. He missed Kalen. Dear spirits, he wanted to hold her in his arms. Maybe he should give this whole thing up. He could find some place in the Heartland woods where they would never be found. The two of them could just vanish and let the rest of the world fend for itself. Why should he care? They didn't. Zed, I need you here to help me. Richard saw light creep across the room toward him when the door opened. He looked over his shoulder to see Kara standing in the doorway. Raina was just behind. Both wore their brown leather outfits and mischievous smiles. He was not amused. Lord Rall, glad to see your handsome hide back in one piece. With a smirk, she tossed her blonde braid back over her shoulder. Did you miss us? I hope you will not... Get out. Her playful smile withered. What? He rounded on her. I said get out, or did you come to threaten me with an Aegeal? I don't want to look at your Mord Sith faces right now. Get out. Kara swallowed. We will not be far if you need us, she said in a small voice. She looked as if he had slapped her. She turned and ushered Raina away with her. When they had gone, Richard slumped down in a tufted leather chair behind a small, dark, glossy table with clawfoot legs. The smoky, acrid smell from the hearth told him it was oak, a choice he would have made himself for such a cold night. He pushed the lamp to the side near the wall where hung a grouping of small paintings of country scenes. The largest was no bigger than his hand, yet each still managed to portray grand, sweeping vistas. 
He stared at their peaceful views, wishing life could be as simple as it looked in the idyllic paintings. He was brought out of his thoughts when Ulick and Egan appeared with General Rybish at the door. The general clapped a fist over his heart. Lord Rall, I'm relieved to see you've returned safely. Did you have any success? Richard shook his head. The men you sent with me were as good as your word, but the conditions were impossible. We managed to track them for a ways, but they went up Stenter Street into the center of the city. Once they did that, there was no way to tell which direction they took. Probably to the northeast, back to Nicobaris. But we swept a circle of the entire city anyway in case they went another direction and could find no trace of them. A meticulous search of all the possibilities took quite a while and allowed the storm ample time to cover their trail. The general grunted as he thought. We questioned the ones they left behind at their palace. None knew where Brogan went. They could be lying. Rybish's thumb stroked the scar on the side of his face. Take my word, they didn't know where he went. Richard didn't want to know the details of what had been done on his behalf. From the signs at the beginning, we were able to discern that there were only three. Undoubtedly, Lord General Brogan, his sister, and that other one. Well, if he didn't take his men, then it would appear he was simply running. You probably scared the wits out of him, and he just bolted for his life. Richard tapped a finger to the table. Maybe. But I wish I knew where he went just to be sure. The general shrugged. Why didn't you put a tracer cloud on him or use your magic to follow his trail? That's what Dark and Rawl did when he wanted to follow someone. Richard knew that all too well. He knew what a tracer cloud was from its unfavorable end. This had all started when Dark and Rawl had hooked a tracer cloud to him so he could come and collect him at his leisure in order to recover the Book of Counted Shadows. Zed had stood Richard up on his wizard's rock to unhook the cloud. Though he had felt the magic flowing through himself, Richard didn't know how it worked. He had also seen Zed use some of his magic dust to cover their trail, to keep Dark and Rawl from following, but he didn't know how that worked either. Richard didn't really want to shake General Rybish's faith in him by admitting he didn't know the first thing about magic. He wasn't feeling very comfortable with his allies at the moment. You can't hook a tracer cloud to someone when there's a sky full of storm clouds. You couldn't tell which was yours in order to follow it. Lunetta, Brogan's sister, is a sorceress. She would use magic to obscure their trail. That's a shame. The general scratched his beard, apparently believing the bluff. Well, magic's not my specialty. We have you for that business. Richard changed the subject. How is everything going here? The general grinned wickedly. There isn't this sword in this city that isn't ours. Some of them didn't like it, but once the alternatives were clearly explained, they all went along without a fight. Well, there was that much. The blood of the fold at the Nakobaris Palace, too? They'll be having to eat with their fingers. We didn't let them keep so much as a spoon. Richard rubbed his eyes. Good. You've done well, General. What about the Mriswith? Have there been any more attacks? Not since that first bloody night. It's been real quiet. Why, I've even slept better than I have for weeks. Since you took over, I've not even had any of those dreams. Richard looked up. Dreams? What sort of dreams? Well, the general scratched his head of rust-colored hair. That's odd. I don't really remember them now. I was having these dreams that troubled me greatly, but since you came, I haven't had them. You know how it is with dreams. After a while, they fade and you can't remember them. I guess. This whole thing was beginning to feel like a dream, a bad dream. Richard wished that was all it was. How many men did we lose when the Mriswith attacked? Just shy of 300. Richard stroked his forehead as he felt his stomach lurch. I didn't think there were that many bodies. I wouldn't have thought it was that many. Well, that includes the others. Richard took his hand away from his face. Others? What others? General Rybish pointed through the window. The ones up there. Nearly 80 men on the road up by the wizard's keep were cut down too. Richard swung around and looked out the window. Only the silhouette of the keep was visible against the deep violet sky. Would the Mriswith be trying to get into the keep? Dear spirits, if they were, what could he do about it? Kalin told him that the keep was protected by powerful spells, but he didn't know if the webs could hold back creatures like the Mriswith. Why would they want to get into the keep? He told himself not to let his imagination run away with him. The Mriswith had killed soldiers and other people all over the city. Zed would be back in a few weeks. 
and would know what to do. Weeks? No, it would likely be more than a month, maybe two. Could he wait that long? Maybe he should go have a look. But that could be foolish, too. The keep was a place of powerful magic, and he knew nothing about magic, except that it was dangerous. He would just be asking for more trouble. He had enough trouble. Still, maybe he should have a look for himself. That might be best. Your dinner's here, Ulick said. Richard turned back. What? Oh, thanks. Mistress Sanderholt had a silver tray loaded with steaming vegetable stew, black bread slathered with butter, spiced eggs, herbed rice with brown cream, lamb chops, pears with white sauce, and a mug of honeyed tea. With a friendly wink, she set down the tray. Eat all your dinner. It will do you good. And then rest well, Richard. The only night he had spent at the confessor's palace, he had slept in the council chambers in Kaelin's chair. Where? She shrugged. Well... You could stay in... She paused, catching herself. You could stay in the Mother Confessor's room. It's the finest room in the palace. That was where he and Kaylin were to have spent their wedding night. I wouldn't feel right about that just now. Is there another bed I could use? Mistress Sanderholt gestured with a bandaged hand. The bandages were less bulky now and cleaner. Up that wing at the end, take to the right, and there is a row of guest rooms. We have no guests right now, so you can have your pick. Where are the moored... Where are Kara and her two friends sleeping? She made a wry face and pointed in the opposite direction. I directed them to the servant quarters. They share a room there. The farther, the better, as far as he was concerned. That's good of you, Mr. Sanderholt. I'll take one of the guest rooms, then. She elbowed Ulick. What would you big boys like to eat? What do you have? Egan asked, with a rare show of enthusiasm. She cocked an eyebrow. Why don't you two come to the kitchen and choose for yourselves? She saw the glance to Richard. It's just a short distance. You won't be far from your charge. Richard threw the sides of his black Mriswith cape back over the arms of the chair. He waved for them to go as he took a spoonful of the vegetable stew and a swig of the tea. General Rybish clapped a fist to his heart and bid him a good night. Richard acknowledged the salute with a flourish of brown bread. Chapter 20 it was a relief to be alone at last. He was weary of people standing ready to jump should he command it. Though he had tried to put the soldiers at ease, they had been apprehensive about having him along, seeming to fear he would strike them down with magic should they fail to find Brogan's trail. Even when they couldn't, and he had told them that he understood, it didn't put them at ease. Only near the end had they relaxed a bit, but they still watched him constantly in case he should whisper an order they might miss. It unnerved Richard to be surrounded by people who held him in such awe. His mind churned with troubled thoughts as he downed the stew. Even if he wasn't half starved, it could have tasted no better. It wasn't freshly made, but had simmered for a good long time, bestowing on it the rich melding of flavors that no ingredient but time could add. When he looked up from his mug of tea, Berdeen was filling the doorway, his muscles tensed. Before he could tell her to go away, she spoke. Duchess Lumholtz of Kelton is here to speak with the Lord Rall. Richard sucked a piece of the stew from between two teeth as he locked his eyes on Berdeen. I'm not interested in seeing petitioners. Berdeen's advance was halted by the table. She flicked her wavy brown braid back over her shoulder. You will see her. Richard's fingertips stroked the familiar nicks and scratches on the hickory handle on his knife at his belt. The terms of surrender are not open to discussion. Verdine planted her knuckles on the table and leaned toward him. Her agile, at the end of the fine chain at her wrist, rolled around her hand. Her blue eyes were cold fire. You will see her. Richard could feel his face heating. I've given my answer. You will get no other. She didn't back away. And I have given my word that you would see her. You will speak with her. The only thing I will hear from Kelton's representative is unconditional surrender. And that is what you shall hear, the melodious voice came from a silhouette just beyond the doorway. If you will agree to hear me out, I have not come to make any threats, Lord Ra. In her soft, humble tone, Richard could hear the hesitancy of fear. It evoked a pang of sympathy. Show the lady in. His glare returned to Berdeen. And then shut the door behind yourself on your way to bed. He left no doubt in his tone that it was a command, and he would brook no violation. Showing no emotion, Berdine went to the door and held her arm out in invitation. 
When the Duchess stepped into the warm glow of the firelight, Richard rose to his feet. Berdine cast him a blank glance and then shut the door, but he hardly noticed. Please, Duchess Lumholtz, come in. Thank you for seeing me, Lord Rao. He stood mute a moment, gazing at her soft brown eyes, her curvaceous red lips and her thick mane of black hair, ringlets of it framing her flawless, glowing face. Richard knew that in the Midlands, the length of a woman's hair denoted her social standing. This woman's long, luxurious hair bespoke a standing of high order. The only hair he had seen that was longer was a queen's, and above that, the mother confessor's. Dizzy, he drew breath, and suddenly remembered his manners. Here, let me get you a chair. He didn't remember the Duchess looking like this, possessing such pure, captivating elegance, but then he hadn't been standing this close. He remembered her as ostentatious, with unnecessary glitter and paint, and a dress not at all simple and delicate, like the one she wore now, of simple, supple, rose-colored silk flowing easily over the contours of her form, complementing her voluptuous shape, cinched just below her breasts. Richard groaned when he remembered their last encounter. Duchess, I'm sorry I said such cruel things to you in the council chambers. Can you ever forgive me? I should have listened. You were only trying to warn me about General Brogan. At the mention of the name, he thought he saw a flash of fright in her eyes, but it was gone so quickly he wasn't sure. It is I, Lord Rahl, who should beg forgiveness. It was unpardonable of me to interrupt you before the assembled representatives. Richard shook his head. You were only trying to warn me about that man. And as it turns out, you were right. I wish I had listened to you. It was wrong of me to express my opinion in the manner I did. A demure smile graced her features. Only the most gallant of men would try to make it seem otherwise. Richard blushed at her calling him gallant. His heart was thumping so hard he feared she would be able to see the veins in his neck throb. For some reason he imagined his lips brushing past the loose wisp of downy hair hanging free in front of her exquisite ear. Pulling his gaze from her face was almost painful. A small voice of warning was sounding in the back of his mind but it was being drowned out in the roar of a river's flood of warm sensations. In one hand, he snatched the twin to his tufted chair and spun it around in front of the table, holding it out for her. You are most kind, the Duchess stammered. Forgive me, please, if my voice is less than steady. It's been a trying few days. As she moved in front of the chair, her eyes tilted up to meet his again. And I'm just a little nervous. I've never been in the presence of such a great man as yourself, Lord Rahl. Richard blinked, unable to leave her gaze when he thought he had tried. I'm just a woods guide a long way from home. She laughed, a soft, silky sound that turned the room into a cozy, pleasant place. You are the seeker. You are the master of Dahara. Her expression slipped from amusement to reverence. You may one day rule the world. Richard reacted with a wincing shrug. I don't want to rule anything. It's just that... He thought he must sound a fool. Won't you sit down, please, my lady? Her smile returned, radiant, warm, and of such tender charm that he found himself frozen in its glow. He could feel the sweet warmth of her breath on his face. Her gaze lingered. Forgive me for being so forward, Lord Rahl, but you must know your eyes drive women mad with longing. I'd venture you broke the heart of every woman in the council chambers. The Queen of Galia is an extremely fortunate woman. Richard's brow furrowed. Who? The Queen of Galia, your bride-to-be. I envy her. He turned away from her as she sat lightly at the edge of her chair. Richard pulled a deep breath, trying to clear his swimming head, and went around the table to sink into his own chair. Duchess, I was so sorry to hear of your husband's death. She averted her eyes. Thank you, Lord Rahl. But don't be troubled for me. I have little grief for the man. Don't misunderstand me. I didn't wish him harm, but Richard's blood heated. Did he hurt you? When she glanced away with a self-conscious shrug, Richard had to forcibly resist the urge to take her in his arms and comfort her. The Duke had a vile temper. Her graceful fingers stroked the sleek fur at the edge of her ermine robe. But it wasn't as bad as it must sound. I rarely had to face him. He was away most of the time, in one bed or another. Richard's mouth dropped open, he would forsake you to be with another woman? Her reluctant nod confirmed it was so. It was an arranged marriage, she explained, 
Though he was of noble blood, for him it was a move up in station. He gained his title by marriage to mine. What did you gain? The ringlets of curls at the sides of her face swayed across her cheekbones as she glanced up. My father gained a ruthless son-in-law to run the family holdings, and at the same time he rid himself of a useless daughter. Richard came halfway out of his chair. Don't say such a thing about yourself. If I had known, I would have seen that the Duke had a lesson. He sank back down. Forgive my presumption, Duchess. Her tongue leisurely wet the corners of her mouth. Had I known you when he struck me, perhaps I would have been bold enough to have sought your protection. Struck her. Richard ached to have been there, to have been able to do something about it. Why didn't you leave him? Why would you endure it? Her gaze sought the low fire in the hearth. I couldn't. I'm the daughter of the Queen's brother. Divorce in such high ranks is not permitted. She suddenly blushed with a self-conscious smile. But listen to me ramble on about my petty problems. Forgive me, Lord Rao. Others have a great deal more trouble in their lives than an unfaithful husband with a ready hand. I'm not an unhappy woman. I have responsibilities to my people that keep me occupied. She lifted a slender finger, pointing. Could I have just a sip of tea? My throat is dry from worry, thinking you... The blush revisited her cheeks, thinking you would chop off my head for coming to you against your orders. Richard shot to his feet. I'll get you some tea that's hot. No, please. I don't want to inconvenience you. And just a sip is all I need, really. Richard snatched up the mug and offered it to her. He watched her lips mold against the rim. He glanced at the tray, striving to put his mind back to business. What is it you wish to see me about, Duchess? After she had taken a sip, she set the mug down, turning the handle back around before him the way it had been. There was a hint of red print from her lips left on the rim. Those responsibilities I spoke of. You see, the Queen was on her deathbed when Prince Phyron was killed and died herself soon after. The prince, though he had uncounted bastard offspring, was not married, and so had no issue of standing. Richard had never seen eyes of such a soft brown. I'm not an expert on matters of royalty, Duchess. I'm afraid I don't follow. Well, what I'm trying to say is that with the queen and her only descendant dead, Kelton is without a monarch. Being the next in line of succession, the daughter of the queen's deceased brother, I will succeed to Queen of Kelton. There is no one I need turn to, to seek direction in the matter of our surrender. Richard struggled to keep his mind on her words and not her lips. You mean that you have the power to surrender Kelton? She nodded. Yes, Your Eminence. He felt his ears redden at the title she had given him. He picked up the mug, seeking to hide as much of his coloring face as possible. Richard realized he had put his lips where hers had been when he tasted the piquant print left on the rim. He let the mug linger as he felt the smooth, honey-sweet warmth slide across his tongue. With a shaking hand, he set the mug on the silver tray. Richard rubbed his sweaty palms on his knees. Duchess, you heard what I had to say. We fight for freedom. If you surrender to us, you will not be losing something but gaining. Under our rule, for example, it will be a crime for a man to harm his wife, the same as it would be were he to harm a stranger on the street. Her smile had a hint of merry scolding to it. Lord Raoul, I'm not sure even you will ever have enough power to proclaim such to be law. In some places in the Midlands, it is only a token fine for a man to kill his wife should she provoke him with any of a list of misdeeds. Freedom would only give men everywhere the same license. Richard ran a finger around the rim of his mug. Harming an innocent, whoever they be, is wrong. Freedom is not a sanction for wrongdoing. People in some lands shouldn't have to suffer acts that in a neighboring land are a crime. When we are united, there will be no such injustices. All people will have the same freedoms and the same responsibilities to live by a just law. But surely you cannot expect that by proclaiming such tolerated customs outlawed, they will stop. Morality comes from the top, such as parent to child. The first step, then, is to set down just laws and show that all of us must live by their maxims. You can never stop all wrongdoing, but if you don't punish it, then it proliferates until anarchy wears the robes of tolerance and understanding. She brushed her fingers through the delicate hollow at the base of her neck. Lord Raal, the things you say fill me with a rush of hope for the future. I pray to the good spirits that you succeed. Then will you join with us? Will you surrender Kelton? 
Her soft brown eyes came up in supplication. There is a condition. Richard swallowed. I have sworn no conditions. Everyone will be treated the same as I have told you. How could I vow equity if I didn't live by my word and rule? She wet her lips again as fear visited her eyes. I understand, she said in a whisper almost lost in the quiet. Forgive me for thinking to selfishly gain something for myself. A man of honor such as yourself could not understand how a mere woman such as I could sink to such a level. Richard wanted to thrust his knife into his chest for allowing fear to haunt her. What is your condition? Her gaze settled in her lap along with her nested hands. After your speech, my husband and I were almost home, and she grimaced as she swallowed. We were almost safely home when we were attacked by that monster. I never even saw it coming. I was holding my husband's arm. There was a flash of steel. A moan escaped her throat. Richard had to force himself to stay in his seat. My husband's inside spilled down the front of me. She gasped back a cry. The knife that killed him put three slices in my sleeve as it passed. Duchess, I understand. There's no need to. She held up a trembling hand, imploring silence so she could finish. She pulled up the silken sleeve of her dress to reveal three slices across the flesh of her forearm. Richard recognized the three cuts of a Mriswith blade. He had never wished that he knew how to use his gift to heal as much as at that moment. He would have done anything to take the angry red cuts from her arm. She drew the sleeve down, seeming to read the concern on his face. It's nothing. A few days and it will be healed. She tapped her chest between her breasts. It's what they did to me in here that will not heal. My husband was an expert swordsman, but he had no more chance than would I against those creatures. I will never forget the feel of his warm blood down the front of me. I'm embarrassed to admit that I screamed inconsolably until I could tear that dress off my body and wash the blood from my naked flesh. For fear I'll wake and think I'm still in that dress, I've since had to sleep without any bedclothes. Richard wished she had used words that hadn't put such an explicit picture in his head. He watched the rise and fall of her silken dress. He forced himself to take a drink of tea, only to be confronted unexpectedly with her lip print. He wiped a bead of sweat from behind his ear. You were speaking of a condition? Forgive me, Lord Rahl. I wanted you to understand my fear so you might consider my condition. I was so frightened. She hugged her arms to herself, causing the dress to fold between her breasts as they pressed together. Richard looked down at his tray of dinner as he rubbed his fingertips on his forehead. I understand the condition. She stiffened with courage. I will surrender Kelton if you will offer me your personal protection. Richard looked up. What? You killed those creatures out front. It's said that none but you can kill them. I'm terrified of those monsters. If I side with you, then the Order may send them after me. If you will allow me to stay here under your protection until the danger is over, then Kelton is yours. Richard leaned forward. You just want to feel safe? She nodded with a slight wince, as if she feared he would lop off her head for what she was to say next. I must be given a room near yours, so that if I scream you will be close enough to come to my aid. And? She finally gathered the courage to meet his eyes. And nothing, that's the condition. Richard laughed. The anxiety released its constriction of his chest. You just want to be protected, much as my guards protect me? Duchess, that's not a condition, that's merely a simple favor. A perfectly reasonable and proper desire for shelter from our merciless enemies. Granted, he pointed. I'm staying in the guest rooms off that way. They're all empty. As one who sides with us, you're an honored guest and may have your choice. You can have one right beside mine if you would feel safer. She had not even smiled before in comparison with the radiance that came to her face now. Her hands crossed over her breasts. She let out a huge sigh as if liberated from the greatest of dreads. Oh, Lord Rolf, thank you. Richard brushed his hair back from his forehead. First thing tomorrow, a delegation escorted by our troops will leave for Kelton. Your forces must be brought under our command. Brought under? Yes, of course, tomorrow. They will have a personal letter from me and the names of all our officials to be informed. Kelton is hereby a part of Dahara. She bowed her head, her dark curls slipping across her rosy cheeks. We are honored to be the first to join. All Kelton will fight for freedom. Richard let out a huge sigh of his own. Thank you, Duchess. Or should I call you Queen Lumholtz? She sat back, her wrists draped on the arms of the chair, 
her hands pendant. Neither. One leg slid upward as she crossed it over the other. You should call me Catherine, Lord Raw. Catherine, then, and please call me Richard. Quite frankly, I'm getting tired of everyone calling me. As he stared into her eyes, he forgot what he was going to say. With a coy smile, she leaned forward, one breast slipping past the table's brink. Richard realized he was sitting on the edge of his chair again as he watched her twist a ringlet of black hair around a finger. He focused on the tray of food before himself in an attempt to control his roving eyes. Richard, then. She giggled, a sound not in the least bit girlish, but both husky and womanly at the same time, and not at all ladylike. He held his breath lest he sigh out loud. I don't know if I can get used to addressing such a great man as the master of Aldahara so intimately. Richard smiled. Perhaps it will simply take practice, Catherine. Yes, practice, she said in a breathy voice. She suddenly blushed. Look at me going on again. Those painfully handsome gray eyes of yours do make a woman forget herself. I had better leave you to your dinner before it gets cold. Her gaze lingered on the tray between them. It looks delicious. Richard jumped up. Let me have some brought for you. She withdrew from the brink of the table, putting her shoulders back against the chair. No, I couldn't. You're a busy man, and you've already been too kind. I'm not busy. I was just having a bite before I went to bed. At least you could sit with me while I ate, and perhaps share a little of it with me. There's more here than I can eat. It would just go to waste. She drew closer to him, pressing against the table. Well, it does look sumptuous. And if you aren't going to eat it all, maybe just a nibble then. Richard grinned. What would you like? Stew, spiced eggs, rice, lamb? At the mention of lamb, she let out a throaty murmur of pleasure. Richard threaded the gold-rimmed white plate across the tray. He hadn't had any intention of eating the lamb himself. Since the gift had awakened in him, he wasn't able to eat meat. Something to do with the magic at the time the gift manifested itself. Or perhaps it was as the sisters had told him. All magic must be in balance. Since he was a war wizard, maybe he couldn't eat meat in order to balance the killing he sometimes had to do. Richard offered her the knife and fork. Smiling again, she shook her head and with her fingers picked up the lamb chop. Keltons have a saying that if it's good, nothing should come between you and the experience. Then I hope it's good, Richard heard himself say. For the first time in days, he didn't feel lonely. With her brown eyes fixed on his, she leaned forward on her elbows and took a dainty bite. Transfixed, Richard waited. So, is it good? In answer, her eyes rolled back in her head and her lids slid closed while she hunched her shoulders and moaned in perfect rapture. Her gaze came down, restoring the torrid connection. Her mouth enveloped the meat and her flawless white teeth tore off a succulent chunk. Her lips were slick with it. He didn't think he had ever seen anyone chew so slowly. Richard pulled the doughy center of the bread in two giving her the one with the most butter. With the crust, he scooped rice out of the brown cream. His hand paused before his mouth as she took the butter off in one long lick. She let out a throaty purr of approval. I love how soft and slippery it feels against my tongue, she explained in little more than a whisper. From her glistening, dangling fingers, she let the chunk of bread drop to the tray. She watched his eyes as she dragged her teeth across the bone, gnawing along its ridge. With sucking nibbles, she scoured the length clean. The piece of bread waited before Richard's mouth. Her tongue stroked against her lips. Best I've ever had. Richard realized that his fingers were empty. He thought that he must have eaten the scoop of rice until he saw the white splat on the tray under him. She plucked an egg from the bowl, pressed her lips around it, and bit it in half. Mmm, luscious. She placed the round end of the other half to his lips. Here, try it. Its silken surface had a mildly spicy tang against his tongue and a flexible, resilient feel. She pushed it all the way in with one finger. It was chew or choke. He chewed. Her gaze left his to roam the tray. What have we here? Oh, Richard, don't tell me it's... She swirled her first and second fingers around the bowl with the pears. She sucked the thick white sauce off her first finger. Some of the coating on the other dribbled down her hand to her wrist. Oh, yes. Oh, Richard, this is fabulous here. She put her second finger up to his lips. Before he realized it, she had the whole length in his mouth. Suck it clean, she insisted. Isn't that the best you've ever had? Richard nodded, trying to catch his breath after she drew her finger out. She tilted her wrist. 
Oh, please, lick it off before it gets on my dress. He took her hand up in his and put it to his mouth. The taste of her galvanized him. His lips on her flesh made his heart pound painfully. She let out a throaty laugh. That tickles. Your tongue is rough. He let her hand go, rousing from the intimate connection. Sorry, he whispered. Don't be silly. I didn't say I didn't like it. Her eyes found his. Lamplight glowed softly on one side of her face, firelight on the other. He envisioned raking his fingers through her hair. Her breaths were the mate of his. I did like it, Richard. So did he. The room seemed to be spinning. The sound of his name on her lips sent waves of euphoria coursing through him. With the greatest of effort, he forced himself to stand. Catherine, it's late and I'm really tired. She rose willingly, eagerly, a graceful movement that betrayed her shape through the silken dress. His control threatened to unravel completely as she slipped her arm around his, pressing close. Show me which room is yours. He could feel her firm breast crushed against his arm as he led her out into the hall. Ulick and Egan stood not far away with their arms folded. Farther off at each end of the hall, Kara and Raina came to their feet. None of the four showed any reaction to his having Catherine on his arm. Richard said nothing to them as he headed for the guest rooms. With urgent insistence, Catherine's free hand stroked his shoulder. The heat of her flesh against him warmed him to his bones. He didn't know if his legs would make the journey. When he found the wing with the guest rooms, he gestured Ulick and Egan close. Take shifts. I want one of you on watch at all times. I don't want anyone or anything coming into this hall tonight. He glanced at the two moored Sith waiting at the far end. That includes them. They asked no questions and vowed it would be so before they planted themselves. Richard took Catherine halfway down the hall. She was still caressing his arm. Her breast was still pressed against it. I trust this room will do. Her lips parted as her chest heaved. Her delicate fingers clutched at his shirt. Yes, she whispered in a pant, this room. Richard summoned every ounce of strength. I'll take the room right next to it. You'll be safe here. What? The blood drained from her face. Oh, please, Richard. Sleep well, Catherine. She tightened her grip on his arm. But, but you have to come in. Oh, please, Richard, I'll be afraid. He squeezed her hand as he took it from his arm. Your room is safe, Catherine. Don't be concerned. There could be something inside waiting. Please, Richard, come in with me. Richard smiled reassuringly. There's nothing inside. I could sense it if there were danger anywhere near. I'm a wizard, remember? You're perfectly safe, and I'll only be a few steps away. Nothing will disturb your rest, I swear it. He opened the door, handed her a lamp off a bracket beside the door, and put a hand to the small of her back, urging her in. She turned and ran a finger down the center of his chest. I'll see you tomorrow. He took her hand from his chest and kissed it in as courtly a fashion as he could muster. Count on it. We have a lot of work to do first thing tomorrow. He pulled her door closed and then went to the next. The two moored Sith's eyes never left him. He watched as they slid their backs down the wall to sit on the floor. Each folded her legs, as if to say they intended to be there all night, and each gripped her aegeal in both hands. Richard glanced at the door to Catherine's room, his gaze lingering a long moment. The little voice in the back of his head was screaming frantically. He rested open the door to his room. Inside, he laid his face against the closed door as he caught his breath. He compelled himself to throw the bolt. He sank down on the edge of the bed, putting his face in his hands. What was the matter with him? His shirt was soaked with sweat. Why should he be having such thoughts about this woman? But he was. Dear spirits, he was. He remembered that the Sisters of the Light thought men suffered from uncontrollable urges. With dazed effort, he drew the Sword of Truth from its scabbard, sending its soft, clear ring around the dark room. Richard planted the point on the floor and with both hands held the hilt to his forehead, letting the wrath inundate him. He felt its fury storm through his soul and hoped it would be enough. From a dim corner of his mind, Richard knew he was in a dance with death, and this time his sword couldn't save him. He also knew he had no choice. Chapter 21 Sister Philippa made the most of her already ample height as she stiffened her back while managing to look down her thin, straight nose without making it seem as if she were really looking down her nose. 
but she was. Surely, Prelate, you have not considered this matter thoroughly enough. Perhaps if you were to reflect on it a bit more, you would realize that 3,000 years of results attests to the need. With her elbow on the table, Verna rested her chin in the heel of her loose fist while scanning through a report, making it impossible to look at her without seeing the gold sunburst patterned ring of office. She glanced up just to make sure Sister Philippa was in fact looking at her. Thank you, Sister, for your wise advice. But I have already considered the matter at length. There is no need to put any more digging into a dry well. It just makes you thirstier, which raises your hopes, but not any water. Sister Philippa's dark eyes and exotic features rarely showed emotion, but Verna detected a tightening in the muscles in her narrow jaw. But, Prelate, we won't be able to ascertain if a young man is progressing properly or has learned enough to be released from his Radha Han. It's the only way. Verna grimaced at the report she was reading. She set it aside for later action and gave her full attention to her advisor. How old are you, sister? Sister Philippa's dark gaze didn't waver. 479, prelate. Verna had to admit to herself that she felt a bit of envy. The woman looked hardly older than she, yet she was, in fact, on the order of 300 years older. The twenty-odd years away from the palace's spell had cost Verna time she could never recover. She would never have the lifespan to learn what this woman would. How many of those years at the Palace of the Prophets? Four hundred seventy, prelate. The inflection on the title was hard to detect unless one had been listening for it. Verna had been listening. So you are saying then that the Creator has granted you a span of four hundred and seventy years to learn his work to work with and teach young men to control their gift and become wizards. And in all that time, you have failed to be able to come to a determination on the nature of your students. Well, no, Prelate. That's not exactly what... Are you trying to tell me, sister? That a whole palace full of sisters of the light are not smart enough to determine if a young man, who has been under our charge and tutelage for near to 200 years, is ready for advancement without subjecting him to a brutal test of pain? Do you have so little faith in the sisters, in the Creator's wisdom in choosing us to do this work? Are you trying to tell me that the Creator chose us, gave us collectively thousands of years of experience, and we are still too stupid to do the work? I think that perhaps the prelate is permission denied. It's an obscene use of the Radahan, giving that kind of pain. It can tear the fabric of a person's mind. Why, young men have even died in the test. You go tell those sisters that I expect them to come up with a strategy for accomplishing the task without blood, vomit, or screaming. You might even suggest they try something revolutionary, like, oh, I don't know, maybe talking to the young men? Unless the sisters think they would be outwitted, in which case I would like them to admit as much to me in a report for the record. Sister Philippa stood silent a moment, probably considering the worth of further arguing. Reluctantly, she at last bowed. Very wise, prelate. Thank you for enlightening me. She turned to leave, but Verna called her back. Sister, I know how you feel. I was taught the same as you and believed as you. A young man of a mere twenty-odd years taught me how wrong I had been. Sometimes the Creator chooses to bring His light to us in ways we don't expect. But He does expect us to be ready to receive His wisdom when it's presented to us. You speak of young Richard? Verna picked with a thumbnail at the disorderly edges in the stack of reports awaiting her attention. Yes. She abandoned her official tone. What I learned, Philippa, is that these young men, these wizards, are going to be sent out into a world that will test them. The Creator wants us to determine if we have taught them to endure with integrity the pain they will see and feel. She tapped her chest. In here, we must determine if they can make the painful choices the Creator's light sometimes requires. That is the meaning of the test of pain. Their ability to endure torture tells us nothing of their heart, their courage, or their compassion.